committee. Uh, can I advise members that the committee is in public session, even though the public gallery remains closed to visitors? And can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all members into the spotlight for the next four items? Item one, chairperson's business. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I advise members in relation to the independent review of education and refer members to a cover note from the committee clerk at page four? The terms of reference for the independent review at page six and previous related correspondence at page 27. Can I advise members that the committee has been asked to offer its initial views on the draft terms of reference before they are taken to the executive for agreement? Can I uh, seek members' views on the draft terms of reference and or ask for your comments at this stage? If, if members are considering that, can I um, suggest that the committee would respond to the Education Minister in line with the covering note, welcoming the review, suggesting that the terms of reference be amended in order to confirm that the review will deal with post-primary transfer testing, suggesting that the reference group should include special schools representation, suggesting that the review does consider the relationship with initial teacher education and the department, and seeking clarity on the separate review of the Education Authority and the overlap with the Department of Education Transformation Program. Are members content with that suggestion? Yeah, yes, Chair. Can I hear something else? Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Robbie, yeah. Yeah, sorry, um, and I'm not sure if it fits in with this, but um, the flexible school started, you know, the Minister said it may not require legislation, but the good if it wasn't missed in any conversation that we have. So if, if that could be added just as, as a piece for it to be picked up, I think it um, certainly when you look at the outcomes for premature um, babies, babies born too early, and especially in, in the week that we're in, um, can't remember that that is something that we need to make sure we don't miss at this stage. Yeah, it's certainly something the committee has been raising with the department on a number of occasions. <coughs> so content uh, for us to add that in, members. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, content with all that, and and, and just really uh, wanted to add, chair, and relation to that is uh, the time scale outlined. You know, um, sort of is it feasible? We 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 want to ensure that this that this review. Um, does what we all expect that they do. So I wasn't just a wee bit concerned, but I looked at the time scale, um, and I suppose would like to know more in relation to how all the other reviews will be considered and fed. And I know you mentioned some of them there, uh, Chair, but you've got the educational underachievement one as well. It's running alongside it, um, and, and possibly a few hours. I think you mentioned the review of the education authority that's taken place. So um, uh, that's all really I would add. Clark, what is the Time scale listed in the terms of reference? Well, they haven't given an exact time scale. I get the impression they're saying that it may start in March with interim findings by about this time next year, then final yeah. findings within 15 months. So okay. I yeah. think it's, it's the vice, sorry, not the vice chair, make your point. Okay. Right? Okay. Karen, Peter, sure. Peter, Peter, oh, sorry. Peter, right. That's the time, time frame that's on the uh, document. I know we would all want it done um, as quickly as possible, but for some of the scale, I think it's important that it's done right. Yep. Robin? Uh, through you, Chair, can I ask Peter, in, in, given that this is coming out of new decade, new approach, and it's an executive uh, uh, strategy, what uh, discretion has the Minister? I think the Minister will go back to the executive. The member's quite right. So he will go to the executive, and the executive will agree. Um, but the committee actually wrote to the Minister and said, could we be involved in the drafting of the terms of reference? And he obligingly has written back and said, yes, so here they are, what do you think? Um, but it, as the member rightly um, alludes, it will be for the executive to decide what the terms of reference are. Um, in the end, just the minister has asked for the committee's suggestions. So uh, that's okay, what Chair, Thank you. Okay. Any other members on that item? No. Okay, content with that, Clark? That agreed? Yeah, members agreed with that approach? Agreed? Agreed. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, Clark? Yep. See. Yep. Okay, members, agenda item 1.2, the Northern Ireland Teachers' Pension Scheme. Can I remind members that the 2019-20 annual report on accounts of the Northern Ireland Teachers' Pension Scheme was circulated by email earlier this week and advise members that the accounts show significant liabilities 
over 500 million pounds associated with the McLeod judgment and a judgment relating to the rights of same-sex partners. Can I seek the committee's agreement to write to the department and seek clarity on the likely impact of these judgments on the short-term costs of providing teachers' pensions and the timescale by which the extent of these liabilities will become known? Members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Okay. Members, uh, item two, apologies. Can I ask members if you're aware of any apologies? None received. Nope. Okay. Sorry, is Morris on the phone there, Chair? Uh, I think Morris uh, texted me there and said he was going to join us. But, uh, he's the Chief Daniels just joined us. Um, and, uh, <coughs> Morris is, uh, said he would join us. He was trying to get on. Yeah. Okay. That's fine, sir. No problem. Okay, members, agenda item three, draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 11th of November 2020 at page 34 of your meeting packs and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings? Agreed? Agreed. Thank Agreed. you. Thank you. And advise members there are no matters arising. <coughs> Okay, members, uh, agenda item five is our, our first oral briefing from the Children's Law Centre on COVID-19 access to special educational needs services for vulnerable children. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a note from the committee clerk at page 42 and a briefing paper from Children's Law Centre at page 48? Can I welcome Catherine Stevenson, Solicitor, Head of Legal Services at the Children's Law Centre, Eamon McNally, Mental Health Solicitor at the Children's Law Centre, and Rachel Hogan, Special Educational Needs Representative at the Children's Law Centre. By way of welcome, can I say, when lockdown began, the Education Committee expected schools to be uh, overwhelmed with children wanting to attend and strict social distancing rules to be applied. Um, that wasn't necessarily the case and instead very uh, few children uh, were able to attend school and the focus of concern rapidly changed to ensuring that vulnerable children had access to special educational needs support. The committee asked many questions about this matter and received inadequate answers. When lockdown ended and restart began, we assumed that special educational needs services um, would return. And recent evidence from multiple stakeholders, however, suggests that this has not been the case. The Education Committee is therefore very glad and grateful to welcome the Children's Law Centre, uh, who have worked uh, tirelessly on these issues and who hopefully can shed light on the current situation and perhaps also inform our response to the related Department of Health consultation. Can I advise witnesses that the committee will give them up to 15 minutes to make an opening statement uh, in relation to the above issues and then take questions from members? Okay, I hand over to the Children's Law Centre representatives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Can you hear me all right? Yes, Rachel, thank you. Oh, that's great. So I'm Rachel Hogan, uh, Chair and members from the Children's Law Centre. I'm going to speak for a few minutes. Um, I'm the Special Educational Needs and Disability Representative at the Centre. And then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Eamon, who's the Mental Health Solicitor. And that'll be followed by Catherine, our Head of Legal, to deal with a number of different issues briefly. Uh, and then you can certainly ask us any questions around that. Um, the Children's Law Centre, for anyone who's not familiar with our work, is an independent charity. And we work to uphold children's rights um, with the hope of changing their lives for the better to make sure that there's legal compliance with their rights. We're founded on three core principles, which is that children should not face discrimination in their lives because of their background or status, uh, including disability and special needs. Um, that children's voices should be heard in all matters when decisions are being made about them. Uh, and very importantly, that when decisions are being made about children, that they should be made in their best interests. So the best interests of the child should always be a primary consideration. Um, and that's really a key factor in what we're talking to you about today, because we feel that the best interests of the child has most certainly not been at the centre of decisions that have been made. And we've seen very harmful fallout as a result of that. Uh, our organisation carries out legal work, um, including judicial review and strategic litigation, advice work, policy uh, work, 
training and we have a youth advisory group as well. And we've recently launched an online uh, live chat platform called Rewrites Responder for young people to access directly. We've provided the committee with a key point briefing, uh, which is really a synopsis of what has gone into our full consultation response in relation to the cross-departmental action plan for vulnerable children and young people. Uh, and certainly children within our education system uh, come in all different forms and there are many, many different groups of vulnerable children within that, that we need to be concerned about. To give you some of the key factors that we have uh, realised as this pandemic has progressed, we've seen that the Department of Education and the Department of Health uh, and maybe other departments have failed to comply with their statutory quality duties under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act. Uh, and that includes failure to consult relevant stakeholders, failure to screen policies properly, failure to gather the evidence from people who are affected so that proper decisions can be made to avoid harm when policies are being uh, set out or to mitigate unavoidable harm. Uh, and we'll be saying to you today that there has been avoidable harm, physical, mental uh, harm caused to children and young people uh, by the policies that have been rolled out and the restrictions. We feel that the definition of who is a vulnerable child actually needs to be broadened uh, to include children who are living in poverty, children in uh, statutory care, statutory sentence, um, in hospital, in the juvenile justice system, uh, and also children who are at home uh, when their peers are being educated in school by qualified teachers. And uh, That group of children has emerged more recently since education restart. The action plan that the uh, Department of Health uh, is leading on and that the Department of Education and other departments are feeding into appears to be um, mainly retrospective. So it talks about actions that have been taken in the past or services that were already available. It doesn't include uh, forward-looking actions to deal with the issues that we're, we have emerging in waves throughout this pandemic. It doesn't seem to provide for proper contingency planning or to build back services either to the level they were at previously or to a better level, because we know that services were falling short before the pandemic started. There has been a serious failure to properly balance different harms. So the harm uh, caused by coronavirus and the spread of the virus versus the harm caused by restricting access to education. That includes closing schools, um, disrupting school access, requiring children to go home if they have the virus or have been in direct contact someone who has the virus, uh, children who are ill, children whose parents are sick with things like cancer or have had transplants. Um, those children are all suffering different types of harms and those have not been uh, planned for and services have not been put in place and that's still the case today. What have we seen? We have seen children physically harmed. We have seen their parents physically harmed. Um, we have seen children being chemically restrained and that has continued during the circuit breaker. Children have had to be chemically restrained again um, because there were no services for them. We've seen family life disrupted to the point where we don't know how families are even functioning at all. Uh, we actually think there has been inhuman and degrading treatment meted out to the most vulnerable people in our society and that their right to life has been put at risk and remains at risk for some families. We had previously submitted a, a video to the committee uh, made by Open Democracy about our client Tina and her 17-year-old daughter Lauren and we encourage uh, you to look at that and take that into account as part of our evidence today because it's the voice of a parent who, who prior to making that video was really invisible and silent whose daughter has autism and severe learning difficulties had no access to school, uh, no respite originally, no respite or school during the previous circuit breaker and we're looking at situations where three adults are having difficulty restraining this young person. Um, and we currently can't access two people to take her out for a drive away from the home. And that's the type of situation that's been going on for that family since March, in fact, prior to March. Um, we have no uh, vulnerable child process to identify these children who are at risk, no visible process um, that we can access. So we're going to the Department of Health and Education in relation to individual children and seeking help, we're getting very minimal help in return. Uh, and we worry about all those children who, who don't have an advocate and who don't know how to access help. Um, children who are at home when their peers are at school, what we're finding there is that different children in the same family are getting differential treatment. So um, children who have no SEN might be able to access some remote learning, some online uh, work with their class even on occasion. Um, children who have 
special educational needs and disability and the same family aren't getting anything, even though they've got a greater level of need and maybe have a full-time classroom assistant. So we have questions about remote teaching and remote learning, um, which is not the same as sending home worksheets or putting things in Google Classroom. It's actually teaching young people with special educational needs and disabilities or young people who don't have any of those um, protected backgrounds, but whose parents maybe aren't equipped to teach them or who are working and so on. And we believe that the department should issue a temporary continuity direction in order to promote a proper standard of remote access to education for children who we are asking to stay at home or children who are medically advised to stay at home or children who have no choice in the matter and are at home and not in school. Uh, we note that the Department of Education recruited 1,000 emergency volunteers during the pandemic and on their website um, state that they're, they're quite pleased they haven't had to deploy any of those because schools are managing. Um, I can report to you that schools are not managing. We're having contact from schools that are on the brink of closure at this very moment. Schools here are on part-time timetables and they're telling us they need a bank of staff ready to back up. So they need a bank of classroom assistants and those people need to be access checked and trained um, in all sorts of special needs and safety requirements so that they can be deployed if staff are off sick. Um, and I think some schools are really going to struggle to stay open as far as Christmas at the rate we're going. And this means that some children, as I say, are not accessing full-time education. Children with special needs or disabilities are not receiving the support, the, the support that they require and that they're legally entitled to. We have full strength legal duties back in force since the 24th of August after the department had originally diluted those duties to a best and leverage duty. Um, so children with statements and children with uh, um, stage two, stage three special educational needs are not currently having their needs fully met. Uh, some schools aren't allowing external people into school. Some services are restricted and are not offering one-to-one -one services. Um, it seems to be uh, services like uh, literacy support, autism support, those sorts of services that are really, really essential and are not being provided at the moment. Um, and so I think I leave it there, other than just to point out a couple of actions that I think would be useful things, steps that could be taken in relation to those matters. So first of all, full equality impact assessments should be carried out before policies are rolled out. If they're already rolled out, the equality impacts need to be assessed and measures put in place to safeguard and protect the most at-risk children. Um, we need properly resourced contingency plans. We need direction from government departments. They need to use their powers of direction and follow that up with resources and not leave it to the discretion of schools because schools are simply struggling to stay open at the moment. They don't have the time and resources to make these types of decisions. Um, we need that bank of backup staff to be put in place. Direct pupil support services need to be restarted on a direct level. Um, we, we need to think about what services are essential. What do we designate as priority? Essential services that cannot be removed in order to ensure that legal compliance is met. So that includes entitlement to education, entitlement to disability support, entitlement to special educational provision, entitlement for children in need who need social services support uh, and to link in with school. We need a clear, visible, vulnerable child process um, drawing upon lessons learned throughout the pandemic. Uh, we should dispense with any unnecessary emergency legislation which weakens protection for children. Um, and I'll finish by saying we should have legal compliance, legal compliance with Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, comply with the Special Educational Needs and Disability Northern Ireland Order 2005, comply with the Education uh, Northern Ireland Order 1996, uh, comply with the Children Northern Ireland Order 1995, comply with the Children's Services Cooperation Act 2015, and comply with the Human Rights Act 1998. Those are your minimum basic standards of legal compliance. Um, so I'll leave it there and I'll pass to my colleague Eamon, who's our mental health solicitor, and he'll talk to you about uh, respite. Thank you, Rachel. I would just like to draw to the committee's attention the issue of respite. Um, I don't need to tell you that it's a really well-established fact that the care system as we know it could not operate if it was not for the work carried out by informal carers. In fact, statistics would show that there are over 200,000 people in Northern Ireland who have a caring role. Now, one of the services that are available to carers to allow them to continue in that role is respite or short breaks. And the purpose of that is really to provide children and young people with the opportunity to socialize with others outside of their family circle 
and it's really to provide the carers with the necessary breaks to allow them to continue with that caring role so that the family can maintain themselves as a unit. Short breaks can take many forms. They could be for something as short as a few hours, or they could lead to overnight respite. Access to respite services is really a pre-pandemic issue, and it has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been limitations on the respite services for years leading up to now. Those who use uh, the short break services report to us that it's an essential service, but we're aware from our own casework of the limitations of that service now and in the pre-pandemic phase. Uh, by way of example, there are really limited spaces within the respite units. For example, if we take Belfast Trust, it has two beds in Willow Lodge, four beds in Lindsay House, and eight beds for children with a medical need and learning disability in Forest Lodge, and that's for the entire Belfast Trust population. So, unfortunately, during the pandemic, the respite units were closed and the timing of this closure couldn't have been worse because it coincided with the closure of special schools and with the pressure on services in the home due to absences. And families really been concerned about bringing extra people into their homes and increasing the footfall into their homes where children have very vulnerable medical needs. We are working with a number of families who were doubly impacted by special school closures and by respite services closing at the same time. Some of these families have had to choose between allowing carers into their home to help them with their very vulnerable children or not allowing these carers into their homes to protect the children from the virus and then having to cope without any help at all. Some families with direct payment packages were similarly impacted as they were unable to access external providers. So respite services currently have not fully recommenced. Families have been without that already limited but essential service since March 2020, and at the same time, limitations on their other outlets for their vulnerable children with disabilities have closed as well. So it's essential that short break services are available to meet the needs of these very vulnerable children with complex needs and to meet the needs of their carers. I think the recognition that the need for respite services for these vulnerable children and their families is highlighted by the impending cross-party motion on the subject of respite that itself recognizes that services for those with complex and high support needs were already dangerously low before the COVID-19 outbreak and the pandemic has reduced care provision further and that there has been a disproportionate impact on those who require high levels of support and that such support has not resumed fully and in some areas, respite services are being used as temporary residential facilities due to a lack of switch placement for children who cannot live at home. Really, respite and short breaks have always been an essential service to protect the well-being, the health, and the safety of complex, vulnerable children with disabilities, their siblings, and their carers. Respite is now even more essential to vulnerable families during this period of emergency as they have suffered hardship, isolation, mental and physical injury, and interference with family life for many months. Some extremely distressed and vulnerable children have been chemically restrained as a direct result of the loss and disruption of respite and education services. These children who are most in need have been deprioritized for services. Respite facilities have been repurposed with no notice or no consultation on the matter and the available evidence of the lack of consultation raises serious concerns and questions with us. CLC is extremely concerned that there was no mention of respite services in the Vulnerable Children's Action Plan, and we would strongly recommend that this is addressed as an immediate priority, with respite being recognised as a primary protective factor in the lives of vulnerable children with complex disabilities, and that resources need to be directed to meet the pre-existing and the additional needs of these vulnerable children and families. To finish, respite is even more important than ever in the context of disruptions to school attendance. And we are aware of families who were assessed prior to the pandemic as needing respite in addition to special education supports, being left with no services, which has caused physical and mental harm to vulnerable children and their carers. I'd just like to hand over to Catherine now to finish the presentation. Thank you, Damon. Can, can people hear me now? Yeah. Yes, Catherine, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you. Look, thank you for the opportunity for all of us today coming from CLC to give evidence to the committee. 
Um, I just wanted to reiterate um, some of the points that Rachel had made and also to say that as well as consulting with vulnerable children and their families in individual cases, um, we have also engaged with a range of special schools to try and understand the gaps and challenges that they're facing and the lessons they've learned from previous lockdowns and some of the solutions as well. We know that some children are not attending school in the long term um, due to uh, family members with underlying health conditions. We know that there are increasing numbers of children in poverty as a result of COVID-19. Um, we know that vulnerable staff um, are needing to self-isolate due to underlying health conditions. And there are growing pressures on schools around recruitment of substitute teachers and assistants. Um, there's an ongoing challenge to fulfil vacancies and there's no pool of staff, as Rachel has said, and no reserve lists. They're all exhausted um, by the department. Um, it's leading to partial closures and suspension of classes. And there's a real challenge here um, to deliver remote learning to children with profound, multiple and highly complex needs at home. Due to digital poverty as well, some children won't be able to be taught online with no access to IT or the internet. Some parents at home are ill-equipped to support their children to learn as well. So a lot needs to be done in terms of supporting families and supporting and empowering parents to deliver education at home. Um, there's also a lack of consistency and access to educational supports and health supports. Um, there were gaps during lockdown due to redeployment of staff, and there really does need to be continuously planning to ensure that online support, for example, from OTs and speech and language therapies can be delivered to families at home whenever they can't attend schools or spe in special schools, they have access to those um, health providers. Um, in terms of solutions moving forward, there does need to be better consultation with all stakeholders around contingency planning. Um, and that means consultation with parents, with children, with health providers, with schools, and with the wider civic society and, and the likes of Children's Law Centre and other NGOs. When we were speaking to principals, we were told that there was a lack of prior consultation when the departmental guidance was issued for educational restart. Um, and uh, management and operational decisions then fell to business. There needs to be real inclusion in short, medium and long term planning moving forward to ensure that vulnerable children's needs are met. Um, we need to build back better. Um, there's an increased level of need precipitated by COVID-19 and the pressures in the system have been exposed and exacerbated. Also, there need to be clear lines of responsibility and accountability. There needs to be continual assessment of need and mechanisms for access to additional resources where gaps are identified, and that's for vulnerable children particularly. Um, I would like to talk a wee bit more about supporting remote learning and what the potential wide-ranging benefits are for, for, for children. Um, but maybe when, when we get to the questions, we can, we can talk about that. But the big message that I suppose we want to deliver today is around collaboration. And it's absolutely key that in the interface between health and education, there is full collaboration. Health need to work in partnership with education to improve children's outcomes and ensure access to education. The Children's Services Cooperation Act is the main legislative um, tool that we can use. Um, there are requirements to pool resources, to join funding streams, and to collaborate on the delivery of services for children to promote children's wellbeing. Um, in terms of contingency plan for future lockdowns and circuit breakers, um, in speaking to schools, we are hearing that the most worrying pupils for them are the pupils where parents are not in contact with, with the schools, where children have been withdrawn from school, and there have been voices concerned around children who are on the verge of care. Teaching staff and classroom assistants can't access children's homes, so colleagues and help need to take the lead. Um, there needs to be reinstatement of community-based provision, social work contact with families, um, and there's a need for wraparound care for the most vulnerable children and families. We all need the process for identifying the most vulnerable children and prioritising access to services. There needs to be timely and effective multidisciplinary responses and ongoing monitoring of impact and, and needs. Uh, being addressed. Um, in terms of the um, current legislative requirements, 
Um, in the key point briefing, we have referred to a number of provisions um, that are the really the statutory duties that are best served to protect vulnerable children and young people. The real actions needed now are that the Department of Health and the Department of Education should dispense with um, introduction of the emergency legislation and regulation which dilutes those obligations and we need to safeguard and promote the well-being of children. So, for example, the temporary modification um, notices that the, the regulations that were issued for children's social care um, have been extended for a further six months without any consultation. Um, we know that the Department of Education issued temporary modifications at the start of lockdown and that those discontinued in August. But there is provision and there's power within the Coronavirus Act to reintroduce those at any time and dilute the measures. So we want to guard against that. Um, also, um, in terms of the children's order, um, children in need need to be provided for an Article 17, 18 and 21 of the children order. Um, ensure that children should be able to access uh, services. Um, also, in terms of the Children's Services Cooperation Act, um, there's a real need to fully comply with the duty to cooperate under Section 2 of that Act. Um, resources need to be directed to vulnerable children. Uh, specialist respite facilities for disabled children with complex needs should not have been repurposed, and all vulnerable children cared for within the statutory system need to have their needs met. Um, an appropriate and safe setting staffed by professional staff. Um, there is a legacy here of over 10 years of austerity cuts pre-COVID, and we recognise that there are significant gaps in the delivery of children's services. These have been only exposed and exacerbated as a result of COVID-19, and the Children's Law Centre calls for the government to build back better for the longer term with a strong, cohesive, cross-departmental children and young persons strategy underpinned by adequately resourced cross-departmental services budgets aimed at increasing capacity to meet the evidence need. We certainly have plenty of evidence to provide in terms of need, and um, that is certainly set out in the, in the longer briefing document that's been provided to the committee. Um, and there also needs to be emphasis on um, Section 4 of the Children's Services Cooperation Act in terms of pooling and funding resources. It's absolutely imperative that uh, cross-departmental ministerial accountability is in place to ensure the implementation of the children's strategy. Okay, and the Catherine, last... can I... Yeah, sorry, yeah. you okay to bring your remarks to a close there, Catherine, just to make yeah, sure you get some good absolutely. questions as well. Thank you. Yeah, the only other thing that I wanted to mention, uh, Chair, is that um, whilst it's not yet commenced, Section 4 of the new SEND Act uh, the 2016 Act, which is uh, passed and obviously we're waiting for the regulations to be finalised and the code to issue, it further reinforces the principles within the Children's Services Cooperation Act and it requires, once it's in place, the Education Authority and the Health Trust to cooperate in the delivery of services for children within the new SEND framework. And I think it's very important to highlight that um, you know, the Children's Services Cooperation Act can only be built upon um, and the focus should be to protect those most vulnerable children in education. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that evidence. Um, the, the Education Committee has obviously prioritised the issue of special educational needs well before COVID and at the immediate onset of COVID. Um, I, I can have consistently asked the Education Minister uh, from the start of COVID about schools, about special educational needs provision and about childcare. And I think COVID-19, as you said, has exposed the inadequacy of support services for children and families with disabilities and with complex needs. We, we know that, but it is still no less shocking to hear your evidence today, including quite clear assertions that, um, that the uh, impact of COVID-19 and the response to it has caused harm uh, to the point of uh, inhuman and degrading a tre a treatment occurring. Um, we know that schools, special schools closed, respite services ceased overnight with no proper consultation, no equality screening and, and no real plan for alternative provision. We, we questioned that from the start of COVID and one of the key responses that the 
uh, Education Minister and the Department for Education gave us was that a, a multidisciplinary panel process was going to be put in place to identify uh, and respond to need. We've continued to ask questions about uh, the efficacy of that process um, and not received the answers that we would like to have received. Are, are you um, more familiar than we are with those outcomes in terms of that vulnerable child process? Do you know how children are identified, how they're referred, um, what, if any, outcomes are being achieved in terms of the reinstatement of services for them, and indeed, um, how many vulnerable children we're talking about that have actually um, been uh, considered by that process? Uh, could I maybe answer that, Chair? I can yeah. give you some information about it. Um, we, were, like yourselves on the committee, were questioning various uh, staff in the Education Authority and the Department of Education from the beginning of the pandemic about what was happening with these vulnerable children. Uh, and we gradually became aware that there was no coherent vulnerable child process. Um, we had weekly meetings uh, about this with various staff. And every week we went along and we, we talked about individual children and, and were consistently told, um, well, we were sorting something out, we are putting a, a process in place, just, you know, hold <coughs> off. And we were reassured and we, we felt, oh, yes, something's being put in place between health and education. But gradually, weeks and weeks and weeks passed. Uh, and, and every week I was saying, well, what about... What about Lauren or what about this child or that child? This is happening to them and what is actually going on? What are you doing to help them? Uh, and it was all a lot of uh, talk about bureaucracy and data sharing agreements and, you know, trying to move, get a process in place. But it wasn't quick enough um, to help the children that needed it. So eventually what emerged, there were a number of different avenues in for children. So they could go to their school and say to the principal, uh, I'd like my child's a vulnerable child. And we're talking here in this context about the most complex vulnerable children, so those who would have needed to attend maybe special schools who are at risk at home because of challenging behaviours that arise from distress. So it's a smaller group within the whole group of vulnerable children, but really at risk uh, families where siblings and, and were being harmed and parents and children were being harmed. Um, at that very moment, we were asking for the help. Um, the process that emerged then was, OK, so you could go to your school. The school might say, well, we're closed. Uh, you could go to your social worker or the social worker might try to raise with the school, will you please open to take in this child or a handful of children? And some schools were refusing to open and the department was refusing to direct, direct schools to open, which it had the power to do. Other schools were opening and trying to admit certain children, but they weren't admitting all the children that we thought they should be, admitting some very vulnerable children. Those most challenging children were the ones who were being risk assessed out of the process. Um, there was departmental guidance, which had a two-step uh, guide number one a multidisciplinary assessment is it in the child's best interest to be out of the home and if the answer is yes then you have to provide them with supervised education in a school or if that's too risky because of the second step risk assessment then you would have to provide them uh, with provision outside the home elsewhere maybe through social services um, and we were finding that this just they weren't picking up all of the children we had some very very vulnerable children that were flagged up to the department and the education authority very early by medical professionals and by ourselves. And then gradually what emerged was a, uh, there was a, a process, a joint health and education process, which seemed to involve the deployment of one sort of senior uh, statutory officer who did her very best, I have to say, to phone around medical professionals, ourselves, families and schools and get together meetings and would come back then with, well, we can give the child three sessions between now and the end of the summer, or the end of the term before summer, or six sessions. But they hadn't consulted the parent, so maybe it was clashing with some respite that they'd managed to, to get. So, uh, so, the, so uh, a lot of parents actually rejected the offers that were made. And we know that, um, I think I have a PowerPoint here, we got some information from the department around the numbers just in August. Um, and they said there were 209 pupils identified through that joint process. Um, and we've counted that 71 of those didn't actually get a supervised education placement. 40 placement office offers were declined. Um, 14 placements they decided weren't suitable or weren't required. Was there a challenge mechanism? I doubt it. Um, 17 pupils simply weren't placed. Um, 138 pupils were placed. 
Well, we know of, of many children who didn't even make it into that consideration. Um, maybe their social worker didn't bring their name forward or or the parent didn't come forward. They've been hold, these parents have been holding on as tight as they can, knowing that there's restrictions in services and trying to battle on. Some of them are only starting to come out now that we're aware of. Um, we're having to take legal actions against the Department of Education and we're probably going to have to do the same in relation to uh, respite as well because we, we just can't get these services. So what happened was the EA then put up an, an online form that, you could, that was purportedly there to help people. Um, I got my client Tina, who made the video, to fill in that form and she got a response back and said, your school is closed, we'll let you know if anything changes. So that was the response that she got. Um, so our point was that vulnerable child process wasn't adequate. It didn't do what it was meant to do. We were assured that there was a lessons learned process happening in relation to that and that lessons had been learned and our comments were taken on board. But we don't know what lessons were learned or what, what part of our comments were taken on board. And that's largely because there currently is no vulnerable child process. I'm not aware of any. Uh, there is a, there's an oversight group that health and education, so the health and social care board, and uh, the departments, um, and the, I think the PHA might be on it as well. That's all I can tell you about it. I know they've been meeting weekly. They were meeting weekly at a point. I don't know if they're meeting now. I don't know anything else about it because the information is so hard to, to get. But one of our big points today is there needs to be a coherent process to properly identify these children with visible pathways into it. So that, for example, if I identify a child, I can refer them in uh, rather than writing, you know, 20 emails to the EA and then going up to the departments and still getting uh, no help. Um, so it needs to be coherent and it needs to be, um, it needs to be multidisciplinary. And that's where a pooled budget would come in. You put a pooled budget in, you put proper resourcing in, you don't put one person in charge of it. Uh, you, you put a team in. Um, and you, you run it properly and effectively. And that's what we would like to see, see urgently put in place from now until the end of the pandemic, till the end of the emergency. And actually some of these children were vulnerable before this and we didn't do anything for them. So maybe we need a permanent vulnerable child process. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so much, so much to get through here. I'll, I'll bring other members in as well. Then Karen Mullen, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Rachel, Eamon, and Catherine. Um, and thank you not only for today, but the great work that you do. My office is in regular contact with, with yourselves, um, as you know, and my constituents, the managers, went through a number of training, which has been really, really beneficial um, in relation to the work that we've done. And I suppose I just want to pick up where Rachel finished off in relation to the vulnerable child process. That is my experience as well, Rachel, and I am still sitting here today in the middle further forward. Um, uh, I actually found um, between the committee uh, updates and then the updates from the department, I was getting conflicting uh, messages around what the process was. Uh, you were relaying this to parents who didn't know, and you were also then advising parents to go to the principal. Um, he wasn't medically trained uh, and the principal didn't know, so then I was saying the phase and principles from what they're doing. And still today, I, I don't know what that process is, so um, it's, it's, it's disappointing to say the least. I suppose over the last few weeks and months, we've heard from a number of contributors to the committee, particularly those who have autistic children. And uh, you also, Rachel, you also raised it here today and that they have been particularly abandoned um, by health and education, but not just um, from March, this is ongoing, and and, uh, and again, through the, the, the new restrictions. So I suppose what I wanted to be asked, uh, Rachel, um, have you seen any improvements for young people in this recent circuit breaker? Has um, the department's learnt any lessons from the last time and put contingency, places, or contingency plans in place? For example, I met with the uh, Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists, and they were telling me at the time uh, the first round they were their staff was deployed to residential care homes, um, and rightly there was a pressure there. But great to really have talked about the many volunteers as well, and the other staff that have been redeployed. Did we see a different approach? Did we see homes getting worked? I, I would love to say yes. I would love to say yes. I have been sitting every week trying to get help for individual families here in sheer crisis. Mm -hmm. 
And my experience has been over the circuit breaker headed, it has been even worse if that's actually possible. There has been no contingency planning. And if I take Lauren as an example, I've been given permission to talk about her case. She's a very vulnerable young person who's been through a terrible, terrible time and her family are exhausted. Um, and, and I knew there was talk of a circuit breaker, so I wrote to the department. I ended up going up to the departments because I couldn't get anything lower down. So I went to the departments of health and education and I pointed out, there, you know, there's talk of a circuit breaker. What is your contingency plan? What plan have you in place for these children? Uh, and the answer that I got back was, oh, there hasn't been an executive agreement that there's going to be a, be a circuit breaker. So I'll take that, that there wasn't a contingency plan. I then had to, once the circuit breaker started, that child had no school to go to. Her school hadn't intended to close. It had to close, directed to close. Um, her respite facility had been repurposed for, for a child who had nowhere to live in the community, was placed into the respite facility and it was then closed. There is no planned respite available or there wasn't at that time. Um, and it's still extremely disrupted at the moment. She still can't get any respite. Um, so over the circuit breaker, one of the things they did during the lockdown was she got some drives out. So two staff took her out for a few hours and that was enormously beneficial for her family and for her. Um, and the reason they were able to do that was because some staff had been redeployed into the Children with Disabilities team to give them a little bit of backup and support. And social services at that time, I have to say, were doing their best with what they had available, which was very little. This time, they had nothing to give, nothing at all. Um, and again, I went back to the departments. I raised several children. I gave them a list of children. I gave them information. And they did little bits for those four. I don't know what happened to everyone else out there. Um, circuit breaker continued. The child had no education. She had no respite, no help. Uh, and I went back again. And eventually, she got one drive out on the last Friday of the circuit breaker. And she hasn't had once, nothing since. Uh, and I am literally in meetings constantly, phone calls, emails. What, get me two people, two bodies who can get into a car and take this child out. And the social workers are telling me in both children and adult services, we have nobody. There's no natural thinking, there's no creativity. They're not looking outside to, can other special schools give us somebody? Can the youth service provide somebody? Can we get volunteers from a volunteer scheme? There's just, there's no creativity. No, and, and Rachel, it's, it's absolutely shocking, I suppose. I've said it a number of times. Um, when we went under this in March, we didn't know what we were going to do. We had a written shut down. We had no planning, we had no time to prepare, but we did for September. And we always knew, regardless of closures, we were going to have uh, uh, points of pressure. And uh, just as you mentioned there, in my own city, we were two weeks ahead of ours in terms of the restrictions. But even before that, our special school had to close for a week because there wasn't um, the uh, specialist uh, some provision that could go on and help out. So there, there, there was no planning. And at that stage, I had raised it with the minister and asked what contingency was put in place. And again, you mentioned when you were giving your briefing and you're 100% right, schools are not managing. And again, in my city, I'm seeing schools closing or struggling to stay open. I do believe that when they come to that point that we're going to have closures. At the minute, there's large numbers of children at, at home, um, either self-isolating or because of uh, positive cases. And then those that are vulnerable and, and medically vulnerable, again, uh, and those with special education needs are left behind. Um, so I suppose just, and again, I, I was glad that you're here today and you talk about respite. Um, again, before we went under the restrictions in Derry, uh, the Western Trust closed all the, the short provision uh, respite services. They said because of the staff pressures, they wouldn't tell us when it was going to open. Then we went under the six weeks of restrictions. So now we're sitting seven, eight weeks and um, those have been closed. Uh, and we're in the same situation as the Belfast Trust, they're very limited anyway. So there was always pressure saying, no planning, no support, no looking at how we can get it in. And it's and it's just really, really, really sad. I, I think to, to hear that this has gone on, um, and we know that things aren't going to get any better in relation to what we're dealing in terms of COVID. I suppose I just want to finish on a different question um, and maybe ask one of these, uh, but in terms of examinations for 2021, given the ongoing disruption, um, how you do children, do you answer the question? How would you suggest that exams should proceed at, at this stage, given everything we're dealing with? 
Uh, Karen, that's something we haven't actually taken a position on, so I wouldn't be in a position to comment on it currently, but it's something we can certainly look at. But obviously, we would have great empathy with young people who are being asked to sit examinations at times when their schools are, are closed. They're being told to go home, but they, the law is telling them they have to go home and isolate. Um, and, and they've made their own views known quite well through their different organisations, which has been very impressive to see. And I think that the, the Minister for Education and the Department has to listen to those young people and give their views proper weight. That's the first thing that I would suggest that is done. Great, Rachel, and I hope that happens because listen to yourselves today in relation to the Vulnerable Children's Consultation. That hasn't happened and it's something we'll be raising in the next session. That's me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, can I bring in Robin Newton, please? Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and uh, thank the members of CLC for joining us today. I, I don't know where you live, but the internet connection is much better from your homes than it is from the Deputy Chair's home. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, can I just uh, have a number of uh, specific questions? Um, uh, I think they were really to uh, Rachel and, and to Eamon. Uh, Rachel, you indicated that you'd been contacted by a significant number of schools who were requesting a bank of classroom assistance, <clears throat> and, and indeed that uh, they were under uh, at continuing additional pressures and at the point of closure. Uh, how many schools would that be? What kind of schools are they? I, I couldn't give you a definitive number of schools. Um, I suppose all of our advice workers, we have an advice team, and then we have our the members here that you have today, and all of us are talking to different um, stakeholders, schools and parents who are telling us that there are restrictions in their school. I think where I'm seeing the biggest impact is in the special school sector, but that's not to say that the mainstream school sector isn't struggling. The difficulty with special schools is their staff are very highly trained. So they would be trained in managing epilepsy, delivering emergency medication, uh, behaviour support, communication support, uh, looking after speech and language uh, needs and assessments around choking hazards, manual handling, um, looking after children who have tracheostomies and so on and who have aerosol generating procedures. Some of those children haven't been back to school yet, incidentally. Uh, so those staff, it's not just a matter of you know, getting a backup or getting a sub. Um, they need people who can be trained, who have a level of knowledge, preferably to start with, and then will need to go through a set of training so that they can safely be deployed even as a number two in the classroom. So schools are telling us that they're literally able to put one person with expertise in a class and then one other, maybe classroom assistant or other assistant in to help them. Um, and if they, get a, if they get a notification during the day um, that a couple of staff from the Stop COVID app have to go and isolate. They've just lost two or three staff. That has a devastating impact on their ability to, to give services. So we've seen letters going out to parents. Some of the very vulnerable children we're dealing with have shared these letters with us to say, uh, your child can only come into school two days a week for the rest of the month uh, because we don't have the staff. And it's really a health and safety issue. We're, um, we can't apportion any blame to the school. The schools are doing everything they can to stay open and, and facilitate their children. Uh, and I just worry that this is the start of another wave. Um, we will have the Christmas break coming up, which might alleviate things a little bit. But in the meantime, what are we going to do with all these children here at home? How are they going to be educated and supported and, and primarily kept safe? That's my concern. So I think we're going to see increasing numbers if the infection rates continuously are. And so this is obviously all related to the infection rate and the spread of the virus. Um, the more that the virus is spreading, the more people who are isolating. Um, our medical services we see are affected, we can't access ordinary health services, but the same goes for education and respite. Those staff need to be on the ground to deliver properly trained staff and uh, they're in short supply at the minute, unfortunately. Okay, well I think the, the, the committee has indeed had uh, paid tribute to all of our uh, teachers, teaching staff, but particularly those in SEND schools who we recognise as doing a, a, a difficult and a, a very valuable uh, job. Can I ask you about, you made the comment about um, <clears throat> you were raising some of your clients' cases, I think you called it, clients' cases, um, and quite specifically one you had uh, 
that the principal was refusing to open and the department was refusing to instruct the school to open. I mean, I'm sure you would agree with me that the, the principal of our, particularly our special needs schools, are extremely responsible, extremely knowledgeable, uh, and indeed extremely caring uh, individuals. So presumably there would have been a very good reason for the principal refusing to open. Well, I, unfortunately, I don't think we can presume that. Now, I agree with you 100%, and uh, I do pay tribute to principals of any school at the moment. Uh, none of us would like to have their job at the moment. It's very, very difficult. Um, and they, they generally tend to, to be very vocational people. They're there because they care about young people, and they're working very, very hard. And it's very difficult for them to, to be criticised. Um, we did criticise some schools for not, uh, we thought, doing enough, for example, not opening at all. Um, and when we had site of risk assessments, so if you take, for example, two, two schools with severe learning difficulties without focusing on any particular one school, if you take two, one has opened, they've got the same profile of pupils uh, and they can meet the needs of a handful of them. And the other one says we can't open because of all these COVID risks like uh, children can't socially distance is the type of excuse uh, or reason or explanation that was given. Now, I think we have to be, we have to be fair. At the beginning of the pandemic, none of us understood the nature of these risks. All of us were frightened um, and principals are having to take care of staff who are vulnerable. Principals themselves might be vulnerable in ways or have health issues. Staff have issues and children are clinically vulnerable. So I have a, I have a very high degree of empathy with school principals having spoken to them. But we were very frustrated, um, I suppose, because we were trying to get help for children. And we, social services were trying to do their best, but we couldn't get access to particular schools. Um, I suppose the alternative would have been the children could have been given a placement in another school. That didn't happen either. So if the education authority thought that the principal made a valid decision in that case, which they may have, um, then they should have looked at a different placement for the children. So I don't mean to be overly critical of principals. I do understand how difficult their job is. Uh, but I did, I did feel that criticism was warranted in relation to the department failing to direct, uh, to look into why can a school not open? What is it that they need? So do they not have health staff available? Let's get the school nurse back in. Let's get the OT back in. Let's put uh, supports in for that school to enable them to open. Um, and I think maybe that's a fairer way to put it. The schools weren't, uh, in some cases, feeling that they were enabled to open and that they assessed the risk as being high. Um, so that's putting it as fairly as I can. Okay. Can I, thank you, thank you. And can I ask Eamon then? And, <clears throat> and I, I think I more or less agree with you, Eamon, in terms of the respite uh, issues and the shortage of respite issues. Uh, but could I ask you, in terms of... Uh, You'd, you'd quoted very low figures for Belfast. Is that the totality of the situation in Belfast, or is there a, a, a wider remit um, for, for respite? Uh, and indeed, um, how is it being limited? Uh, is it purely and simply just because the places are there for what is regarded as a normal situation? But now that we're in a pandemic, that the places are, or is there a shortage overall uh, during the course of the, the, the year? The figures that I gave you are the totality for Belfast. The Belfast has four of the eight beds in Lindsay House, which is really a, a legacy arrangement from the old days of the Eastern Health and Social Services Board. There were plans put forward by the Department of Health well over a decade ago to build a new respite unit, and that has never come to pass. Uh, Willow Lodge itself has two beds, and Forest Lodge has eight beds, which are really for children who have a medical need, so you can be child on a ventilator, for example, with a learning disability. So I think the committee has already heard from the National Autistic Society. So if you take a child who has autism, there's a total of six beds that they can potentially access within the Belfast Trust. There have never been enough respite beds. It has been an ongoing issue that people who were assessed as requiring respite were often put on a waiting list. And that waiting list itself lasted for years before people were able to access the service, if they ever actually able, were able to, because some young people aged out before they got access. So in pre-COVID days, it was a really good service, but a very limited service. The uh, 
What has happened now during the pandemic is that trusts have taken a decision to repurpose the respite units for residential needs. That has highlighted a further issue that there are not sufficient residential placements for children. Because don't get me wrong, the children who are using the respite units for residential purposes are vulnerable in their own right, and they need the needs taken care of. But that shouldn't be at the cost of the very vulnerable children who require the respite services. So the reason why there is really limited or no respite available at the minute is the decision of the trusts to repurpose the units for residential has meant then that families who require the service just simply cannot access it because it doesn't exist. We've been told in relation to Forest Lodge and correspondence from the Department of Health that they will be able to provide for up to six families. But really, how those six families will be identified out of the really large number who need it is unknown to us. So it's, it's about the pre-pandemic situation worsened during the pandemic and the service does resume. It needs to be looked at on the ground that it requires to be improved upon and it resumes not just back to what it was before. And, and being improved upon, is that the facility or facilities you talked about that were programmed for 10 years ago, which haven't, uh, health hasn't it's, delivered on? It's, it's more than that. It's, yes, create more placements, but one of the things that we have noticed in our work in relation to respite is it's back to cooperation. There doesn't seem to be a system, for example, for cross-trust cooperation in relation to respite services. For example, to access staff, to access uh, unused beds and all the trusts. Don't get me wrong, the people that we talk to are very pleased with the service that they receive in each of the three units. But what families are saying to us is they need better access, more choice, and really a wider number of respite units. The service that I'm talking about that uh, was thought of over a decade ago was actually to remove the situation where uh, Lindsay House was shared between Belfast Trust and the South Eastern Trust, that those beds would transfer over to the South Eastern Trust and Belfast with a new respite unit, thus increasing the numbers. But even at that, the numbers of young people who require respite have increased since that was thought about. So we need more and better services for these young people. Thank you, Mr. And it's not just Belfast, it's right across Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Chair's reminding me that my time's running dry, running short. Can I just ask, there is a statement in your paper where it says children are being chemically restrained in the absence of provision of services. Can you quantify that for the committee? Um, I, I can speak to that uh, to a degree. We're talking here again about that group of that smaller group of vulnerable, more vulnerable children. Um, so the children with uh, primarily autism and severe learning difficulties who don't have speech so they can't use speech to communicate uh, frustration. Um, we know that the, from the information the department gave us, 209 children were identified as being in that category, but we don't know how many of them were chemically restrained. Um, I would estimate we have something in the region of um, eight to 10 people that we are aware of who have come to us um, that have had to be chemically restrained. And we have been told by medical professionals that they wouldn't have required this increased doses of PRN, what's called PRN medication, if they hadn't uh, lost the primary protective factor of school attendance and the protective factor of respite. Um, so what happens is when the child gets very, very distressed and starts to hit out, uh, many of these children bang their heads off hard surfaces as a way of, of venting frustration. That could be the floor, uh, a window, another person. We've had children putting their heads through windows um, with the potential for very severe harm and damage there. So, uh, you know, the, the, the psychiatrist in that situation, in the absence of service, is left with no option but to increase um, medication that can be applied immediately to try and um, sedate the child, essentially, so that they will be more calm and can be more easily managed. Uh, and I think... Uh, even a small, it'll, it'll be a small number, I would, I would imagine, but even a small group, that's a very, very serious action to take. So instead of providing education and respite, we will drug this child. On any human rights assessment, that's completely inappropriate. It's, a, it's an abuse of human rights. The service should come first. A child should only be medicated if they need it for treatment, not to sedate them. Uh, so I think that's, in any civilised society, we should not be doing that to children 
who have severe learning difficulties and can't speak to tell us how they feel. I just think it's, it's utterly reprehensible. It should never happen. Well, let me just say I agree totally with you, and that's why I raised the point. Uh, but I, I do think, Chair, we need to know from CLC how that is quantified and where those children we are. Can get some more information. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Uh, before I bring other members in, I just want to say briefly that th this is actually very disturbing evidence, and it is further evidence of a, a disturbing pattern of chronic underinvestment and underprovision in services for children and families with, with complex needs. This committee heard very recently that identified need for an entire new special school in Belfast was made in 2012. We're now hearing evidence that a, a new respite unit was identified over a decade ago. Um, so the, the evidence of under-provision during COVID is just entirely consistent with that, that systemic under-provision um, and complete lack of awareness. Uh, Karen mentioned earlier that we, that, that we were, that, that COVID was a, an emergency pandemic initially, um, but that we had an opportunity to plan for second waves. We agree with Karen entirely, however, we, we know what services are provided for in special schools. We know the extent of them, or, or we certainly should do. Education ministers, health ministers, should be fully aware of the extent of the education and health services that are provided in those schools. They, sh they should have known that from the very outset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And yet the evidence today suggests there is still no coherent plan in place to provide auxiliary services when they can't be accessed at special school. It, it's, it's damning and it's disturbing. Um, I'll, I'll bring in other members, um, obviously, as well. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Yes, Daniel? thank you, yep. uh, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for their presentations. I, I can say I am very, very disturbed by the grave uh, information that uh, you're providing. Uh, I'm also uh, very, very clear uh, on the reality around all of this. There was an SEM crisis prior to COVID. The department knew how serious the situation was. The, the department knew the stress and anxiety amongst the teaching profession in the SEM schools. The department knew the pressures on families uh, and young people. Uh, the EA as well, uh, did they really expect that that wouldn't worsen as a result of this pandemic? Do they really expect, in the absence of schools that been open, that families would be able to cope uh, with their children uh, uh, with severe complex need in many instances uh, without any support, intervention or otherwise from the department or the education authority or other? Uh, this is wholly serious situation and it goes well beyond uh, the warnings that we have provided. The department know fully the serious concerns faced, uh, uh, serious issues faced for those uh, families with SEM children. This, in my opinion, at this stage, giving all the facts and evidence that has been presented, is very much discriminatory against SEM children. Uh, and it's high time that this minister, the Department for Education and the Education Authority stepped up to the mark and started putting the interest of these young people first. There are serious, serious equality issues here. Serious equality issues. The, 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 I can't even find words to explain them. And there's also huge issues around human rights because we don't know how vulnerable families are coping with children, sometimes two children, an instance in almost three children with special educational needs during what has been one of the most challenging times uh, in, in living memory. Uh, and I wrote to Peter Weir in great detail uh, a month ago and received no reply to the serious concerns that were raised. Only uh, since I tweeted the letter two days ago did I receive a reply this morning uh, that, uh, that responded to some of the concerns. No way addressed any of them, uh, just to be blunt, uh, uh, in relation uh, to that. The department are throwing money at everything, but they're doing nothing to resolve this issue. And I want to thank the three of you 
for being so bluntly honest and reflecting the reality that many parents and children are facing. My sister uh, uh, is a, a mother of two children. One of them is five years of age, non-verbal, uh, severe complex need, and I can tell you she has struggled uh, throughout this pandemic. I've watched that child uh, in meltdown mode, and I can tell you it is very, very difficult for me to watch. And I've seen my sister, as that child's mother, in tears, not knowing what to do to calm her child, reassure him, help him, uh, 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 or deal with that frustration. It is wholly, wholly difficult for those families out there. I want to put on record my sincerest appreciation to them for the huge amount of work uh, and, and, and effort that they have had to challenging the department and the education authority and seeking support and giving voice uh, to this very serious situation. So well done, you. I just want to touch on a point that is very, very serious. Uh, and you've, uh, uh, Rachel has mentioned that it's in relation to aerosol generating procedures, children requiring those procedures, sorry, eight months after lockdown, those children are still not in schools. Uh, yes, I know it came to my attention recently when speaking to um, some school staff that um, I think the guidance had changed recently to take some of the children out of the definition of aerosol generating. So if they just needed nasal suction or you know, physical suction, that was now not aerosol generating. So measures could be taken to allow those children back, but still not all of the children are back. And this was raised um, by schools very early on because they knew that when the month when weather was good, they could do some of these things outside. They had a space where they could actually carry out the procedure safely. Uh, but they knew that when the winter drew in, they wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and again, it's a very small but significant, uh, uh, a small number of children, but a very significant impact. Um, and they're some of our most vulnerable children who require a great deal of care at home. Um, and school has a, uh, although school, is, its purpose is not respite, it actually does in fact provide a form of respite <coughs> by taking the child out of the home. And the child is getting social interaction with their friends and peers. Uh, they're getting all the nurturing help, the professional support of the teachers and, and the caring staff in those schools, and, and they're in a safe place. Um, and, and as you pointed out, it is an equality issue. The most disabled, most complex children are getting the least help. Um, and, and you mentioned your, your own sister's situation. Uh, we're looking at families where the child is older. Um, so you've got a, maybe a 16, 17-year-old who's six foot tall and weighs 14 stone, having a meltdown. So that's the type of situation people are actually being asked to deal with every single day for months and months and months. And, and this, is, this is known. These children are known. These were flagged to the Department uh, of Health and Education at a very high level, to my knowledge, towards the end of March. Um, by, sir, not by us. They were then flagged to us and we then also drew them to attention. Um, and even with all of that uh, behind them, we have really struggled to get any support. Now, if we're struggling and we're very determined and we have skills and tools at our disposal and we have a whole team of people working on this issue, um, if we can't get someone to take one of those children out for a drive for a couple of hours, there's something very, very wrong with the system. Uh, and we should be ashamed in Northern Ireland if that's the way we treat our most vulnerable children. No, no, just a, just a, just a two-minute warning. Need you, need you to bring your remarks to a close. Keep, keep going. Thanks. The only way that my sister can calm Ashton, her, her five year old child, is by driving them around the world. And you know, it's, 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 it's such a stressful situation. Most parents, most parents are going through the hard thing, and uh, something needs to be done with the family. Um, just in relation to another point that uh, Rachel that you've raised, um, you mentioned earlier in England there's a minimum standard. Of remote learning for children obliged to learn at home due to health considerations. Um, can you advise us? Has this uh, brought benefits uh, to the children from receipt? And also, would you advocate for a similar direction here? And if so, could it be improved in any way before introduction? Yes, um, we became aware that a temporary continuity direction has been issued by the Department for Education in England, um, and it's a temporary continuity direction on um, remote education. Um, the scope of it isn't wide enough. It really only covers, I think, those children who are at home because uh, they've been told to go home to isolate. I think it's really restricted to where the government has said, you must go home. Um, and they must get access to a certain standard of remote education. We think, and we've asked the department to exercise its power under 30, Section 38 of the Coronavirus Act and Schedule 17, which relates to Northern Ireland, would enable it to direct 
um, schools to provide a certain level of remote access education. Now, we don't mean that in the sense that start bossing schools around and give them more duties to do because they don't have enough to do already. We mean that in the sense of enable, empower, resource, provide support to schools so that the teachers can enable their, all of their pupils to learn whether or not they have disabilities, whether or not they're at home. So things like live links into the classroom um, with support, you know, look into it, cannot be done safely in a way that teachers are comfortable with using C2K Collaborate, for example. Um, could it be done by pre-recording some small lessons or recording sections of a live lesson and then sending it to children? Um, there is a circular that the department has issued that talks about synchronous and asynchronous approaches to learning, but doesn't give any direction or resource behind it and leaves it all up to schools. So yes, we would recommend a temporary continuity direction to provide for maybe a wider range of children, including those at home um, because their, their families are, are ill, like the family at the minute, two parents have cancer, uh, three of the children have special educational needs in the, in the house, one, one of the school children hasn't. They're all getting different things. Uh, should they not have a, a similar standard of education on, on, on basic quality? Um, so yes, we have called for the department has refused. They've said they're not going to do it. Um, they feel that there are resources out there that schools can use. We don't agree with that. Yeah, yeah, and also we have to remember that these resources, because when it comes to special education in schools, are held simply by EA and not by the school in terms of staffing budget. So, serious issue. Chair, does me for a slight point in relation to uh, a, a question I think you need to ask. Um, Richard, you've indicated. Very, um, very think, final question, Daniel, okay, and no supplementary, okay, go ahead. There are currently three judicial reviews in the High Court, I think it's uh, the Damon mentioned that. Against the Department of Education relating to equality and uh, human rights failures associated with the Department's response to this pandemic. Uh, are you at liberty to tell us what brought you to this point? Uh, and I think it's clear from your presentation, but I just wanted to sum up very briefly what brought you to this point uh, and the substance of these claims. I can tell you that I can't say too much about them as their live legal actions, but I can tell you that they're in relation to vulnerable children with autism and severe learning difficulties. Uh, they started out as we couldn't access a vulnerable child process. We issued pre-action proceedings. We did everything that we normally do to try and collaborate. We tried very hard to work with uh, the authorities. We tried to point out their quality duties to them and that the decisions that they were making weren't being properly quality screened. They weren't gathering the appropriate um, evidence about protected groups and therefore they weren't avoiding or mitigating uh, harm. Um, we just could not persuade the department to carry out full equality impact assessments, even given the very grave impacts that I've described to you today. So the three judicial reviews are founded upon breaches of Section 75 equality duties uh, and breaches of human rights that I've described to you. Um, and that's really, they're, they're quite narrow in that sense. And those are sitting with the court with the process. And, and we're also in the process of um, the early stages of commencement of a number of legal actions regarding um, decisions around respite in relation to the Department of Health. These are all interconnected. We shouldn't have to take judicial reviews. Judges uh, don't need to be making decisions about this. Departments should be making decisions, properly screening and equality impact assessing policies, and that would prevent avoidable harm. We can't say that all harm can be avoided. There's a balancing of harms, and it simply hasn't happened. Thank you, Rachel, and I appreciate okay. it. And I know that Nicholas Quinn's sisters and others are listening into this, and they do feel very strongly. Uh, about this entire situation, and I wish you well. You have my full support, uh, and I know all MLAs in this committee know and see every day the huge amount of pressure and challenge that exists, uh, and how the department that continues to deal with these can't happen further. We need to do something about this. Thanks, Daniel. Can I bring in uh, Robbie Butler, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, guys. I think the, mem the other members have asked most of the questions that um, are probably of greatest priority. Um, I'm going to maybe bring in a, just a, a couple of other issues. Um, and like one of them will be looking your opinion on it, and one hasn't been discussed so far. Um, I asked recently for an update from the Minister with regard to some additional spending that he has profiled um, with regard to special education needs. So <clears throat> there's 12.8 million that's been set aside for addressing existing in year special needs demand pressures. I asked the question for a breakdown of that, specifically for special schools. So the breakdown was 3.2 million for special schools. But my issue, my problem with this, and this is an ongoing um, problem, that that money is held centrally by EA. So that therefore the, the uh, special school principals heads do not have the agility, the autonomy um, to 
access that money uh, in a proficient manner and probably not in an expedient manner. I think they're in a, a very difficult position to meet the complex needs um, of some of our most vulnerable pupils. Have you guys uh, ha had, had any um, investigations into that? And what is your assessment of the impact on special schools that have to work through this procurement, or sorry, this, 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 this process for accessing the money uh, for their schools? I don't think that, that has been raised with us recently, uh, Robbie. I don't think I've had any inquiries about it. But what I would say um, is that if money's been delegated to the education authority, then there needs to be a very prompt way of getting it out to schools who need it. And what principals have said to, to me is around certain resources that might be avail available to them. They don't know how to get them. They know what they need and they know what they want to do. Uh, but it's actually staff they need. They need people. <laughs> they need people on the ground. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's often debate about whether money should be decentralised and there was, a, there was a consultation on the common funding formula some time ago and what we said at that time was look if you put accountability mechanisms in place then schools could be delegated more of the money but they need to be the accountability, they weren't, the accountability mechanisms aren't there but I think in a time of emergency you need to be more agile and flexible uh, and principals, you know, and listen to principals, talk to them, ask them, make sure that they are being properly consulted about what that money would be best spent on and, and get it to them as quickly as possible so that they can provide for their children. Uh, they need to be empowered. I think they feel really embattled at the moment. And we need to keep them going uh, with resources, financial and human resources. No, I, I, I totally agree, Rachel. In fact, I, I've spoken to a number of um, special school heads recently uh, myself, and that is, I, I think you, were very, you, you set this out nicely at the start, that the, this is a vocation and that they, they, you, it's a, a challenging job. And, um, the agility needs to be there. The other thing is obviously that it's it is a kind of, it's a kind of specialism, even when you're looking for substitute or banks or people to come in, and that's a that's a real pressure. But I think if they could do it um, with the same agility as other schools in the other sector, then then that would be a big help. Um, there's a one of the earlier pressures that a lot of um, uh, families and, and and pupils of all types face was transport. Transport's still an issue, and I don't think it's been bottomed out in terms of. Um, the uh, appropriateness um, of the safety measures that perhaps are taken at times, um, and uh, in terms of even the quantity of, of children that are on uh, any of the buses. And this goes right across the educational sector. Um, have, have the CLC any position taken uh, with regard to uh, transport for pupils right across the educational sector? Again, no, Robbie, that's not an issue we've had major uh, input about through. I checked with our advice workers before coming here, and that wasn't an issue that they have, have raised. It's more what they've been raising is things around restrictions of access to services within the school. We have had a number of queries about children whose transport has been stopped for various reasons that might be related to COVID risks. Um, and instead of looking for a risk assessment, for example, or providing an appropriate mode of transport, the child is taken off transport and then they can't get to school. Uh, so we've had like single, you know, odd cases like that, um, but to my knowledge, we haven't had an influx. It's, that hasn't been a big focus of our work, um, and there may be other people who could talk to you more about that. Could, okay. could I make, could I make yeah. a point? Sorry, uh, it's just in relation. It's it's backtracking a wee bit, but it's in terms of resources for schools. Um, in talking to principals trying to set up remote learning. One of the big big problems they have is they want to utilise staff that are outside schools so staff who maybe can't work because they're not well enough to come into school but they can provide a service to those schools so um schools are working very very hard particularly special schools in setting up banks of resources for remote learning at the moment so they're they're doing those online lessons they're doing pre-recorded lessons they're they're also trying to do live links to families um and for those parents who can't link in live if there are pre-recorded recorded things, they can reinforce their children's learning and they can do it at another time. So it's really, really essential. But the key thing for schools is they don't have the IT. So um, within a classroom environment, maybe a teacher has a laptop or um, an iPad, but the assistants don't. So if you want to have the maximum impact in terms of producing uh, contingency remote learning for schools, they need a resource of IT, more equipment, um, in order to deliver for children if there's a further lockdown or children can't uh, attend school for any particular reason. And the other thing that they can do is they can support and empower parents, for example, being um, learning to cope with their children outside school by having ASD coping strategies, behavioural support, 
OT support, speech and language, so those special schools can have those, those extra uh, services put online to support families and empower families to look after their children at home. But thank you, Catherine. That's one of the things that I'd actually asked um, uh, when we were asking the minister about computers and IT equipment. That actually some teachers and some support staff we were never in the conversations. It was all about delivering it to the pupils. But what happened when you know? And there's obviously um, GDPR issues and security issues. So um, I think that's a really good point. And um, just two final ones, if it's okay. Um, so we do know that, uh, that mainstream schools. Did um, allow people from other schools to go to um, and use their premises, and, and, and I think it's been said that this didn't happen in special schools. So that is something we need to fix. And I just want your thoughts on that. I mean, it, it's um, I, I, none of us want further lockdowns and the school closures. But we talked about contingencies, and contingencies are not pr predicated on executive agreements. You make contingencies because you plan ahead and hope that it doesn't happen. I don't buy the excuse that you were given that we didn't have a contingency because we didn't know what the executive would want to agree. If you weren't in this executive to agree anything, my goodness, I tell you what, you're, you're, not, you're not very good at forward planning. So that's not acceptable in any shape or form. The contingencies need to be there in special schools. We need to assist them in whatever way it is that we ensure that there is a, some you know, uh, availability. For, even for the respite, as you said, schools aren't for respite, but the reality is in this sector are probably needed. So something about that, if someone wants to answer that, and this is probably for, um, this is in the, for Eamon, in the mental health piece. So um, the impact on uh, people with a learning disability or a special education need is inevitably harder in terms of their mental health, and very often it's overlooked. Eamon, has there been any analysis done or quantification done of the mental health impact on, on these people? That's actually one of the things that we haven't been known for is a quantification of the impact on just generally on our young people's mental health of the whole pandemic. But okay. I can tell you our casework we are experiencing young people whose needs are massively increased from what they were a year ago. I can't quantify you the numbers because the study hasn't been done, but traditionally we are not good at data collection when it comes to our young people's mental health. I know that Queen's University are taking part in a prevalent study at the minute, but if you look at the study on mental health, the most recent figure we have is 20 years old. Mm -hmm. Using figure 1999, our government does with planning, so we need that data to be collected. I can't give you an answer to figure. No problem, Eamon, thank you. And just yeah. if there's anything on that about the schools, places there. Yeah. Can, can I just sort of come back on that too, on, on related to the mental health? We're starting to see, we're sort of seeing our cases coming in waves, waves of issues that emerge. And the latest one that's starting to trickle in, and I think is going to turn into a wave, is um, families of children who attend mainstream schools who have special educational needs are starting to exhibit mental health difficulties that they didn't have before. So as a result of all the disruption, and maybe got used to being at home and now they're having to go back into school, and maybe the supports aren't there or school's different than it used to be or the staff are changing around uh, and a lot of parents are starting to report to us that their children aren't feeling very well and their mental health isn't good uh, and i think we're, we're also seeing children who are regressing in relation to their special educational provision not being met uh, there's a bit of a danger we forget about those mainstream children who have said and they're actually the biggest cohort of children with special needs and we're focusing yeah. on those really really vulnerable children but I feel in a way we're forgetting about all of those ordinary same cases. We are really, I think we're going to see that emerging as time goes on, the difficulties that they're suffering. We're seeing evidence of it now. In relation to your question about contingency planning, contingency planning is completely essential. We know that we, we can't predict, predict anything from one week to the next at the minute. None of us can. But you can, with some certainty, say if schools close, this will be the impact. If respite isn't there, this will be the impact. And the question is, is there a two-step vulnerable child process which is predicated on best interests? Is it in the child's best interest to be outside the home? Yes. Step two, risk assessment. How do we provide, how do we enable provision? Not risk assessment that, oh, we can't do and the risk's too high. You can't leave that child at home in that risk. You have to take them out and put them either into their own school if it's a school issue or another school or another environment somewhere else. You, you, but you start with best interests. If we go back to basics and make all of our decisions based on best interests of children, we literally can't go wrong. So equality and best interests are your two um, planks that you need to be standing on. Okay, Robbie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Justin McNulty.
Thanks, Chair. Um, Apologies this morning, I've had no Very passionate about the work you do, and it's very important work you do, but hearing the information you're presenting this morning is very, very worrying. A society will be judged by how it treats its most vulnerable. I think as Truman said that, and will not be judged very positively in this regard in the last number of months. The, those people who are most vulnerable have been forgotten about and left behind, and it's really, really sad. And it's, it's, it's wrong from so many different perspectives, from an equality perspective, the human rights perspective, and from a child's safety and family's safety perspective. It's so, so worrying. Um, I know there have been many issues already touched on, and I know that the, the, the guess is an issue you've just touched on there, Rachel, which is the broad and diverse spectrum of needs for kids is extraordinary. Now we're talking about somebody from somebody who's got mild autism, maybe dyslexia, who has classroom assistance, to somebody who has complex needs. And I'm most fearful for those kids who have complex needs, but the impact is just as big as on those kids who have dyslexia, who have missed out on their classroom assistant and their, their special attention. Those people who have got autism, who have missed out on their, their classroom assistant over a number of months and they're falling behind and the teachers, when they get back into the classroom, their teachers are trying to play catch up. So the point I want to touch on is the reality of the situation where kids have been left behind for so months, left at home, trying to do online learning, which didn't really work for them because of the, the whatever uh, challenges they faced individually. And then the teachers bring them back in the classroom, they're trying to catch up with them. And teachers are trying to ride two horses here at the same time. They're trying to ride two horses. They're trying to plan for exams, prepare for exams, which are starting on Monday. So a young child with autism who's been left behind for months, who's been left out for months, has an exam on Monday where he has not been able to catch up on. The teacher has, is focusing in on that, but at the same time, the teacher is also planning for maybe that exam might work, might go ahead. So they're keeping the file, they're trying to keep notes, they're trying to keep uh, a day-to-day -day record of how the, the children are progressing and trying to manage that. And it's just not working. So they're trying to double up. So there's a system of doubling up, which is really, really exacerbating the situation both both ends. So just like your perspective in terms of how you see that manifesting itself at present. Well, I think it's, it's. I think what we're going to see it mightn't even have presented itself fully yet, but we're going to start to see the outworkings of that problem, um, in the sense that children's needs are not being met. They haven't been met for some time, and um, we're hearing from some parents that their children have regressed. So skills that they had learned skills that they have because they've had a package around them that have their classroom assistant or if they had dyslexia that had maybe one-to-one -one specialist literacy support that's an extremely important service for those children because it unlocks their potential and if you take that away you're closing a door and it's very hard to get it back open again after a certain amount of time has passed so those support services you know those need to be there as a minimum for those children to even operate or function or access the curriculum at all so they can be in the school but accessing no education. So physical presence in school is not the same as a quality of access to the curriculum. Um, so the supports need to be, that have been restricted or stopped, need to be put back into place so that the package is around the child. Then you're having to deal with getting the child back to where they were so that they can actually demonstrate their competency in an exam, making reasonable adjustments for their examinations so that they can fairly demonstrate their abilities and take into account of what has happened to them and, and I fully sympathise with, with teachers who don't know whether children are going to have an exam or not and are maybe having to assess and I wonder how are children with special educational needs accessing those assessments or demonstrating their capacity and their, comfort, their, their capability in, in different subjects if their supports have been taken away from them and how do we account for that and how do we fairly represent those children. I don't even think we've begun to see the outworkings of this yet. I think all of that is coming down the line um, and I am very, very concerned we, we have a lot of children with very complex needs who are actually in mainstream school now because we have a policy of inclusion. For, for the sake of equality, children with complex special needs can attend mainstream schools. It's their legal right to do so and it's their legal right to be supported so that they can fully access the curriculum. So if they're not fully accessing the curriculum um, because they have a special need and they've been treated less favourably, it's possible they're suffering dis discrimination on the ground of a disability. So we need to be thinking of it from all angles and it's very difficult to put all those pieces of the jigsaw together at once and you're having to look at the individual circumstances. Um, but I think as a, as a basic principle, 
the package that the child needs and has been assessed as needing needs to be in place to enable them to catch up. Children are resilient, they can't catch up uh, and they can be nurtured and they can be given support. Um, but are they going to be back where they started in the next couple of months? Many of them won't. Ms. Friday, in terms of therapies that were revealed to kids before, speech and language therapy, the, even occupational therapy, even physical therapy, um, the kids who've lost out in that for so many months, how has that impacted their mental well-being, their, yeah. their physical health and their mental health and emotional health and well-being? Those, those therapeutic inputs are extremely important because, again, they are the key that unlocks access, access to the curriculum. So if a child needs OT support to help them with handwriting, um, to help them to physically um, cope in the classroom, to help with their sensory needs, and they need speech therapy to enable them to communicate and to socially communicate with peers, or they need behaviour support to help them to behave at, and, and stick to the rules in school and to manage their emotions within the school uh, environment. And as they need literacy support to enable them to read and write and problem solve. Um, or if they need psychology support to identify what their needs are so they can be provided for all of those needs. Um, you know, the thing about it is, if you, if you take the steps, you assess the child, you identify the needs, and you meet that need at the point of need when, it, when it's there, rather than having to wait for it, you provide that support, the child can then function, they can be happy and comfortable in school, and they can learn, and they can access their education. And if you take, up, take that all away, you might have a very frightened child sitting in school, thinking they're stupid, thinking that they're not as good as everybody else, and thinking that they're a second-class citizen, uh, and suffering emotional harm and impact as a result of that. Um, and we don't have to let that happen. If we put the support in place, and schools have been very proactive in, in trying to get keep support going and keep IEPs going for children and targets and target setting and trying to operate as normal. But the disruption, the impacts of the disruption, um, you know, we're not going to see those for a while what they are. I mean, I have, I have a client who's hiding in the grounds of his school at the moment because he can't go in the front door. Um, and I've had to I've had to go to quite some lengths to get that child some support from educational psychology, um, you know. So a child hiding in the ground of the school while his mother drives around in circles, thinking he might go in, and then after an hour she takes him home. And, and that's the response we're getting: is well, we'll wait and see what happens. No, we won't wait and see what happens. We need to access the legal rights for the child now. So the, the whole system has to stop with the excuses and get on with the action and help and support them to the best of its ability. Uh, bearing in mind those more vulnerable children might need more support to re-engage with education. I hear this and I understand you guys, uh, my offices have been inundated with people come and get in touch with me with uh, kids who have got real challenges and whose parents are on their stream dress and I know the teachers are feeling the same way and they're feel, they feel like their hands are tied and I'm just concerned that you know, the case that we're discussing this morning, the kids that you're very familiar with Rachel and uh, Catherine and Neiman, that those kids and those families will just become a statistic. What do we have to do? What has to happen in order to address this issue now so it cannot be discussed the next year, six months' time, or next year, or five years' time, and saying, this is what we should have done, or could have done, it's what we must have done. And you talk about action. What is the action that must happen now in order to protect these kids and families? The solution that, that we have proposed in our papers and that we think is the, is the way to, to make a longer term impact on this is to properly use the Children's Services Cooperation Act and create a children's services budget um, under the children's strategy, which I think is before the executive or has come before the executive soon. So section four of the Children's Services Cooperation Act enables departments and children's authorities to pool uh, both human resources, financial resources, buildings, whatever resources they've got. Um, and if you put a budget in place, you then have lines of accountability. You're setting targets. Um, you're looking at you're identifying the gaps in children's services. You're identifying the unmet need that is there, and then you're addressing that with your children's services budget. And that involves prioritising children and young people and putting money there to resolve this. We're all very familiar, for example, with what's gone wrong in the EA, and we know there's an improvement process there. So there's one piece of work we could be looking at. How do we make that? There's already an improvement process starting there. That, that's a cause for great optimism. Let's really push that hard and get that system improved. That'll make a big difference. We know what's wrong in social services and we know what's wrong with respite. There's another work stream. There's another budget line. Start pouring resources in 
and meeting the needs that have been identified. We all know about them. We've talked about them this morning. We've talked about them many times before. And in the, all of the all-party groups talk about these issues frequently. Nothing has changed. We're fed up talking about it. The only way to make a ta uh, change is by taking action. And that is, I think, by setting up a children's service and budget um, targeted at the gaps that we know are there. Okay, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. I have been coming just with three very, very brief points on top of that in terms of the Children's Service Cooperation Act. Um, one major concern we have in terms of special needs, um, obviously the Education Authority, there's an improvements program. There's a huge backlog in terms of assessments, educational psychology assessments and children accessing statements. And I think that that needs to be addressed in terms of those children who need to be assessed, that they can't be put on the back burner for assessment. They need to be assessed now um, so that statements can be progressed, particularly those children who haven't had a statement before or whose needs have changed. And we're talking about children who might have regressed because they've been out of school. So there needs to be access to those assessments in order to put in place the correct um, support measures for children when they're back in school. In terms of a very practical solution, children need to be able to access counselling and support services in school. Now, there are counselling support services, but we need to ensure that there is enough and that children can access those services as and when they need them, because the pressures outside of school with families due to COVID are also impacting on children's emotional health and wellbeing. And then the other thing is, and it's tied into cooperation, for those children who aren't accessing special schools where services are available, health need to respond and put in place community-based support. So um, if a child is not accessing speech and language and OT or whatever other health service they need and they're not able to go to special school because they're too vulnerable or their family members are too vulnerable or they're isolating because of COVID, that community, there needs to be a community response. Okay. Okay, Justin. Okay. Just very quickly, thank you very much, uh, Rachel and Catherine and Eamon. Very, very important evidence. And uh, I, I will be proposing to that our committee write to the Department for Education, that the Minister and to the Department of Health and to the First Ministers, Joint First Ministers, to implement the proposals that you've made. Because it's, we can't wait in this. We can't delay. It has to happen now. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, thank you Justin. Thank you. Morris, I see your, Morris, I see your hand is raised via Starleaf. Um, I've given massive flexibility in terms of timings this morning and we are well over time given uh, how important the issue is but Morris your hands raised let me make sure you get an opportunity to come in is Morris there yeah well I was here <laughs> there you are Morris you thank you yes go ahead thanks hang on I've lost connection I can't see you oh there we are we can hear you yeah, well, listen, I uh, apologise for missing the, the start of the meeting and uh, uh, the presentation, but if you've covered this topic that I'm going to raise, well, again, I apologise, but it's around the, the, the volunteer scheme administered by the Department of Health and volunteers coming through the, the uh, Department of Education volunteer scheme. Are either of these tools of assistance available? And if they are, are they being utilised? Uh, that's something we, have, we had touched on a little bit there and from what from what uh, we can tell if you go onto the department of education's website and look at their uh, volunteer scheme it says that they have recruited a thousand volunteers but they haven't needed to use any because schools are, are coping just fine now that was probably written some time ago and <laughs> uh, certainly not the case now so one of the questions we're asking we don't know uh, why aren't these volunteers being used uh, and they need to be trained up so that they can do the job properly um, in relation to health, I'm not certain uh, what the situation is. Uh, other than that, there are simply not the staff on the ground. Um, and certain parts of the social services that I've been interfacing with seem to be very uh, sort of fixed on the notion that they'll only use staff from their own team and not maybe looking outside that to other potential sources of people that might be able to help. So, for example, education volunteers could maybe help in health after school hours are over so they could help some of those children with special needs after three o'clock by doing some activities with them and things like that. I, I don't see much planning around that. I don't see any coherent planning, uh, to be fair, across all of these different services. And I think that needs to be brought into focus. I think the issue of volunteers um, or, or backup um, people on the ground, human resources to help health and education is a vital issue. And I, I we'd be grateful to the committee if they would ask some questions around that to get some clarity about it. Thanks very much. I'm sure the chairman will take that up uh, after the presentation. 
Uh, I'd like to thank you for your answers so far on remote education, but I would have also keen to hear your thoughts on schools being uh, open at times when they would not normally be open, provide education and uh, parental respite during the pandemic. And what can this committee do to aid the out of hours opening of schools for children with complex needs and I suppose the associated care and support that they require and what respite that that may give to the families? Yeah, during lockdown, um, there was facility for vulnerable children too um, and key worker children as well to go into school at a, a time when school was closed to other pupils. Um, and we would actually have expected a vulnerable child scheme to have continued to operate continuously throughout the pandemic because there are various reasons why there are disruptions to school. So we've had our circuit breaker and we've children off because they're isolating and we've children at home who should be in school for a whole range of reasons. Um, so our proposal would be that there should be a, a coherent, uh, cross-departmental, multidisciplinary, vulnerable child process that is transparent and open, visible and accessible um, to all those who want to refer children into it, uh, probably with a single point of entry and a lead partner so that it can be properly um, and coherently managed and there can be a point of responsibility. Uh, and that needs to be, that stopped. The vulnerable child process, as far as we know, stopped on the 30th of June. Where is it now? Where's the new and improved version? Let's have it and let's have it up and running um, so that any of these vulnerable families as they arise can be referred into it and given the right support. So if we identify them and we can see what help they need, give that help to them, um, then that'll, that'll certainly make a big difference. Um, so when schools are closed to other pupils, what we would suggest is that there's, it's still open to um, complex vulnerable children who have safety requirements to be out of the home. Thanks very much for that, and thanks, Chair, for your patience. Thanks, Morris. Okay, members, <laughs> thanks very much indeed for those questions. Um, Catherine, Eamon, Rachel, Sincere, thanks for your work, your advocacy uh, on behalf of children and young people for your evidence here today. Um, we will do all we can as a committee to partner with you to achieve uh, our mutual aim of meeting the best interests of children and young people in Northern Ireland. Um, and we'll stay in contact with you uh, about the many issues that you've you've raised. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, members, um, we are uh, using up our time today uh, well, so I will progress to agenda item six uh, with the uh, discretion of the clerk, and we'll come back to actions for our Children's Law Centre briefing and our departmental briefing after this agenda item. Um, agenda item six then, members, is the Department of Education, Education Authority, Department of Health, Public Health Agency and Health and Social Care Board, consultation on cross-sectoral vulnerable children support. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add witnesses? And can I refer members to a note from the committee clerk at page 115, a copy of the consultation document at page 123, recent related committee correspondence at page 136, and papers considered recently in respect of the impact of the pandemic on access to sound support for vulnerable children and young people at pages 140 to 192. Can I welcome, and I've got a, a list here if you all bear with me, Ricky Irwin, Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education, Brenda Shearer, Head of Special Education at the Department of Education, Michelle Corky, Director of Education, Education Authority, Shona Collinson, Interim Assistant Director of Pupil Inclusion, Wellbeing and Protection at the Education Authority, Eilish McDaniel, Director of Child Care and Family Policy, Department of Health, Mark Lee, Director, Mental Health, Disability, Older People at the Department of Health, Geraldine Teague, the lead Allied Health Professionals Consultant at the Public Health Agency, and Morris Leeson, Children's Services Planning Professional at the Health and Social Care Board. Is that everyone, Clark? That's everyone. I'm only counting. So there's six. Okay. Oh, somebody. I think we're just waiting on everyone to dial in. Just ask Ricky to start. Okay, well, by, by, by way of welcome, while we're just waiting um, for all our witnesses to join in, um, can, I, can I welcome um, our witnesses um, and say that from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, I and members of this committee have consistently asked 
the education and the health minister what is being done to identify and meet the needs of vulnerable children and families with disabilities, complex needs, challenging behaviours. And we've taken uh, disturbing evidence today to suggest that inadequate quality screening, inadequate consultation, inadequate planning has re resulted in those children uh, experiencing actual harm and inhumane treatment in families who are now at the end of their resilience um, as a result of a pattern of chronic underinvestment and under provision of services for children and families with complex needs. The evidence has said that the way forward has to be a coherent, permanent, vulnerable children process that must be cross-departmental, multidisciplinary, have pooled resources uh, in order to identify children's needs with a visible pathway to meet those needs. Witnesses, in, in the course of your opening statement, for which you have up to 15 minutes in total, can you please set out why such a process is not in place? Chair, um, Ricky Irwin here. Um, because we're here under the guise of the Vulnerable Children Plan, and that plan is led by the Department of Health, I'm going to invite Eilish McDaniel from the Department of Health to provide the first of three opening statements. I will then follow, and then Mark Lee will follow after me. Okay, Eilish. thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, and Ricky, thank you, um, Chair. Um, good morning to members of the committee, and I want to start by offering my thanks um, to the committee for the opportunity and to provide you with information on the Vulnerable Children and Young People's Plan. Um, I want to explain why it was developed and to say something about next steps. And then Ricky and Mark will then say something about how the Departments of Health and Education have worked together to respond um, to children with complex needs, including those with a disability, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. At the start of the pandemic, um, a decision was made um, by the Department of Health to collect data relating to children who come to the attention of children's social services on a weekly basis. Our concerns initially were triggered um, when the number of referrals to children's social services fell in the very earliest days of the pandemic. Uh, by week commencing the 6th of April 2020, a weekly average of 646 referrals had fallen to 542. In discussions with other with officials in other parts of the UK, we knew um, it was a trend that was repeated in all four um, jurisdictions. The key concern was that um, children were no longer visible to services in Northern Ireland um, when it went into lockdown. However, that trend quickly um, reversed. From late April, the number of referrals to children's social services started to increase. And by week ending the 11th of May, the three-week rolling average for the number of referrals was consistently in excess of the average number of referrals received weekly before the pandemic. This was an indication that the restrictions were increasing pressures on many already vulnerable families. The loss of work or simply being at home for prolonged periods created financial pressures. Isolation and the loss of wider family support and social networks also contributed to family pressures. Many families were not able to access the same level of support from services as before lockdown and school um, closures created particular challenges and um, for families. Also, we know that some children and young people are at greater risk of harm in the home, and this can be due to factors including parental conflict and domestic abuse. Some children are also exposed to risks that originate outside the home, for example, as a result of being online. It wasn't difficult to predict um, that these risks would intensify and, uh, as, a uh, as a result of lockdown, and the data we were collecting and the evidence emerging from practice were clearly showing that that was the case. And we moved quite quickly, and it was referenced by um, the Children's Law Centre to work with the Department of Education and um, to try to get children known social services into school, including looked after children. Health and social care trusts also sought places for um, some children in childcare, including children who not uh, who don't attend um, childcare in normal circumstances. This wasn't without challenge. The overriding public health message at that earliest stage was to stay at home, and many parents and carers were fearful to allow their children to leave the home as a consequence. Indeed, some children um, were fearful um, to leave um, their homes because of the risk that they thought they posed 
um, to their parents um, or carers. Arrangements um, were also agreed with the police at a very early stage to closely monitor families where domestic violence was known um, to be an issue. The joint working arrangements between health and education extended to supporting um, children um, with complex needs during lockdown. Uh, and contrary to what I think was said earlier on, um, those arrangements continued um, beyond the end of June um, in, in, into the summer uh, and in, in preparation for um, school um, restart. But Ricky and, and, and Mark will describe that in a bit more detail. However, um, uncertain about how long the pandemic would last, conscious of the efforts by a number of departments and agencies to support and protect vulnerable children and families, and knowing that we needed a more coordinated cross-departmental interagency effort, we sought to pull um, those efforts together in the form of a vulnerable children and young people's plan. The plan was developed jointly between the Departments of Health, Education, Justice, Communities and the Economy. The stated aim of the plan, um, which we've now consulted on, is to promote the safety and well-being of children and young people during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, both within the home environment and within the um, wider community. It also aims to strengthen system capacity to respond to current challenges and risks and to make preparations for the future rebuild of services. The aims of the plan recognise that there are risks and facing children and young people both in and outside of the home. It also recognises the pressures on the system, both in terms of reduced staffing levels and the challenge of delivering services in the context of public health restrictions. And there's the added difficulty of services having to continuously adapt in response to the progression of the virus and corresponding public health um, restrictions. The scale of the challenge is no greater or no less um, for public services than it is for, for the private sector. It's just the nature of the challenge which um, makes the two different. In terms of the definition of vulnerable child, we cast the net um, very widely. It's intended to include children and young people who were receiving support before the pandemic, as well as those who were experiencing increased pressure as a direct result of the pandemic. It includes children known as um, children social services, including children on the child protection register, in care, on the edge of care, care leavers and children placed for adoption. It extends to children in receipt of child and adolescent mental health services, those who have a statement of special educational needs, or access any illness provision or education nurture units. And it also includes children not known to statutory or voluntary and community support services, but who are vulnerable because their family is under increased pressure due to COVID-19 related circumstances. And asylum seeking and refugee children um, and young people whose parents have no recourse to public funds are also captured by the definition. The plan reflects how services have adopted and enhanced um, provision um, to continue to support children and families during COVID-19, as well as new actions that have been undertaken specifically to address um, some of the um, risks and challenges. A key element of the plan is ensuring that um, children and families know how to access um, supports, and particularly those that weren't available in the usual way. This includes the promotion of helplines such as the NSPCC helpline and the domestic and sexual abuse helpline, uh, which were both advertised across TV, radio and social media early in the pandemic. It also involves signposting families to sources of help, and um, for example, through the family support um, hubs through the COVID-19 um, uh, and, and through the COVID-19 community helpline. We've now got 29 family support hubs um, that operate um, across Northern Ireland, 600 organisations actually attached um, to those hubs providing um, supports um, to families. And I can tell the committee that, um, that through the hubs, families did continue to receive um, uh, supports. Um, the plan also includes direct supports that have been provided to families, for example, provision of digital devices to support home learning, additional funding to support families where there is domestic violence and support for those who need access um, to help, sorry, need help to access food through additional investment in fair share which is a national network of food distributors. In terms of capacity building, this includes putting in place protective measures to allow staff to deliver services to families safely, mm -hmm. uh, measures to ensure adequate staffing levels are maintained and delivering services in different and innovative ways. We've put in place more frequent data collection and um, to ensure that we have the most up-to-date um, information on which to base um, decisions and have continued um, to issue um, guidance in response to changing circumstances. The plan was approved by the executive and issued on the 18th of September for an eight week consultation, um, which closed last um, Friday. There have been 47 responses um, received from, from a wide range of organisations, including CLC, who you've just um, heard um, from, and those responses um, are um, currently being analysed 
um, by the Department of Health on behalf, on behalf of other departments um, at this stage. I, mean, I, I want to uh, emphasise that this was an emergency plan um, developed in response to um, a public health emergency. It wasn't intended to be, nor is it a substitute for longer term planning under the Children and Young People's um, strategy and associated strategies relating to vulnerable groups of children and young people and or their families. The planning process enabled us to identify and articulate risks and challenges experienced by children and families um, during the pandemic and um, to identify what departments were doing in response to those challenges and risks, to identify gaps in provision and to promote um, new responses. The pandemic has prompted, in some cases out of necessity, services to, to be delivered in innovative and new ways. I, I think it's important that we capture um, the lessons um, learned, both, both good and bad, and um, from this experience, and to recognise the extent of the challenge for some children, young people and their families. It will also be important um, to ensure that those lessons learned are applied when we're planning and delivering for vulnerable children and young people um, into the future. And I want to assure the committee that that is what we um, intend to do. At this point, I'm just going to hand over um, to Ricky. Thanks, Eilish. Thank you, Eilish. And thank you, Chair and members of the committee, for the opportunity to brief you on the support offered to vulnerable pupils during COVID-19. I will outline the actions the Department and the Education Authority put in place and the level of cooperation and collaboration between health and education. We appreciate that the current circumstances present significant challenges for families with children with complex needs, and we remain committed to supporting them throughout this pandemic and beyond. Support from schools has been ongoing since March, when the Minister prioritised children of key workers and vulnerable children for access to schools for supervised learning as part of the Department's response to support those most in need during the pandemic. A daily survey was established to monitor the numbers attending schools, which included key workers' children those known and not known to social services, and those with statements of special educational need. The Department asked the Education Authority to establish a process to monitor children and families deemed vulnerable, not attending school, but known to the EA. The monitoring system recorded contact with vulnerable children and families, which allowed for more frequent contact where risk was considered higher. As referenced by Eilish, many parents chose to keep their children at home in line with the overarching public health message or due to shielding. Recognising the low numbers attending and the protective factors provided by schools, the Minister wrote to school principals on the 11th of April, asking them to work with parents, the Education Authority and, where appropriate, social services to urgently identify and assess vulnerable children at their schools to determine if the best interests of the child would be met by supervised learning. Detailed guidance was published on the 10th of April for schools, parents and carers. The Education Authority moved many pupil support and send services to remote and online delivery to maintain contact and provide support to families. Support for vulnerable children was prioritised. During lockdown, the Minister, Permanent Secretary and senior DA officials provided regular, often weekly, verbal updates and written reports outlining the Department's COVID response to the Committee, including for vulnerable children. The Department worked closely with the Department of Health, the EA, the Children and Young People Strategic Partnership, Health Trusts, the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency through a Joint Health and Education Oversight Group to ensure that measures including bespoke arrangements, were put in place to support families on a risk assessed basis and in accordance with COVID-19 guidelines. Trust staff identified a cohort of families with children with complex needs where it was felt that access to school, mainly special schools, would be in their best interests. Operational staff from the Trusts and the Education Authority then worked through multidisciplinary panels to consider individual circumstances. Some schools were accessible from day one, while others required support to enable access given the complex needs of children and the circumstances within the school. Of the original cohort of children identified, 66% were placed, 19% declined offers of placements, in 7% of cases placements were deemed not suitable or not required, and around 8% were not placed due to the complexity of social distancing, accommodation within schools, and the availability of staff. 
We recognise effective cross-sectoral collaboration Ricky, is critical. Can I, can I, Ricky, can I pause you for a second? Percentages are helpful, but I think numbers would be even more helpful. Can, can you give the numbers for those percentages as well, then? I, I, I can, Chris. 209 pupils were identified by the trusts. 138 pupils were placed. 40 placement offers were declined. 14 were deemed not suitable or not required. And 17 pupils were not placed. Thanks. If you're happy, Chair, I'll carry on. Yep, thank you. We recognise effective cross-sectoral collaboration is critical in terms of support provided, and schools and the EA continue to work with the health and social care sector on individual cases. The department and the EA maintained contact throughout the pandemic with special schools principals to listen to concerns and develop bespoke guidance. A summer scheme for special schools was developed and delivered in 21 schools. Aware of the impact that such rapid change in daily life could have for children with Autism Spectrum Disorder, ASD, Middletown Centre for Autism rapidly revised its service delivery model and developed a comprehensive programme of support online, by phone and through resource development for young people with ASD, their families and educators. Both health and education are providing services against the backdrop of challenging factors such as COVID restrictions, social distancing, reduced staffing, difficult childcare arrangements, redeployment to frontline COVID response and school COVID plans restricting access for visitors. The EA and the health and social care bodies continue to work in partnership with schools to facilitate health and education services along with appropriate SEND support and therapies as a priority. Wellbeing support has been prioritised. The department continues to work with health through the weekly joint health and education oversight group to monitor progress for children with complex needs and to put in place multidisciplinary local level solutions where it is safe and appropriate to do so. Lessons learned during lockdown include a single referral point for all vulnerable children during school closure and a jointly agreed best interest test in any multi-agency approach. The Minister's priority is for the continuation of face-to-face -face teaching as the best form of educational provision whilst providing a safe and welcoming environment for children and staff. Ultimately, the physical safety, mental health and well-being of all pupils and staff throughout the pandemic remains paramount. Chair, I'll now hand over to Mark Lee from the Department of Health. Thank you. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, good morning, everyone, and just to add my thanks to those of my colleagues for the opportunity to, to speak to you this morning. Um, like my colleagues, I want to acknowledge that the pandemic has been a, a particularly challenging time, especially for the, the children and the families that we support. Uh, in order to deliver, continue to deliver services, the health and education sector have had to significantly change the way of um, but throughout that, our main focus is to support as many children and families as possible, and in particular, to focus on those with the greatest need. Um, services did continue throughout the pandemic, but they were delivered in a, in a very different way uh, to make sure that we were in line with uh, public health guidance. Um, I just want to assure the committee that the department is acutely aware of the challenges that the pandemic has placed uh, upon families during what is an unprecedented time. Um, the speed with which decisions were made to manage COVID-19, including the sudden closure of schools um, and the need to find new ways of delivering services, uh, undoubtedly had an impact, as I'm, I'm sure you've been hearing. Um, in addition, the public health measures required to manage the transmission have impacted on the ability of staff to deliver face-to-face -face services at the same level that they were delivered uh, pre-COVID-19. Um, and I, I'm acutely aware that the longer the current situation continues, the more the challenges built for young people, <coughs> carers and their families. Um, staff in the health and social care system have been working incredibly hard to try and rise to this challenge and have worked closely uh, with colleagues in education throughout uh, HSC staff and indeed their education colleagues quickly set up processes, mechanisms and supports um, to stay in close contact with families and they used a number of uh, innovative uh, methods and initiatives that were adopted uh, which will be embedded into practice going forward. Um, Ricky's always, already mentioned the, the Joint Health and Education Oversight Group, which is still um, still meeting and has been meeting on a weekly basis since the 9th of April. Um, and that forum has been supported by local professional planning groups who have proactively sought to manage the, the range of needs of children and families during this time. 
um, the panel discussion groups are set up across all trusts uh, with education colleagues and they sought to identify a number of vulnerable children who would benefit from school access during lockdown. I uh, think as, as Ricky's mentioned, uh, panel members work closely with schools providing professional advice and support to enable them to complete individual risk assessments for the children's identified. Uh, and as uh, Ricky's gone into some of the detail there in terms of the, the number of children that were that were placed. Um, these panels have, have changed their focus and updated their membership to ensure the relevant health and education staff um, uh, were part of these to um, support summer support and educational restart. Uh, for instance, particularly as we uh, look more closely at children requiring aerosol generating procedures. Mark, Mark uh, sorry, um, sorry to interrupt for a second. Could you, could you adjust your camera just very slightly so that we can we can see your... Yeah, that, that would be better. Just I've had a request from uh, lip readers to make sure that they can they can see your entire beautiful face. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do apologise. No, Thank that, you. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, children are supported through uh, community based services, um, outreach, uh, enhanced care and support um, to help address some of the pressures they and their families were experiencing. So. Healthcare staff set up helplines, for instance, developed and delivered programs and supports virtually as well as on a face-to-face -face basis as they sought to address the specific needs of children with disabilities and children with special educational needs, as well as children with medical and other health and social care needs. So some families, for instance, receive short break support from trusts in partnership with other agencies. Um, but it is worth noting that short break services were initially um, uh, curtailed to reflect the need to implement public health guidelines around infection control. Uh, the trust did seek to provide alternative supports and have been increasing uh, residential short break capacity. The committee will appreciate we're often talking about children who may be more vulnerable to COVID-19 uh, and trust therefore took a, a cautious approach in the early stages when there were, there were still so many unknowns facing us. Um, Formal mechanisms were put in place during the pandemic to monitor the delivery of short break provisions uh, overseen by the Health and Social Care Board. And where some services could not be delivered, we looked at direct payments or bespoke packages of support um, um, for families and children. Um, children and families who have particularly uh, complex and challenging needs were prioritised and supported with overnight support uh, when necessary. Um, I think from the department's perspective, we're pleased at the way the health and education sector have, have worked so cohesively during this very challenging time. Uh, we've sought to pick up the learning from the first uh, surge and have utilised information and feedback gathered from staff, schools and families and have jointly reflected on this um, in the, the educational restart and the health rebuild programme. That learning continues and there are surveys amongst staff that have been issued and focus groups and engagement with families and children uh, and children and other stakeholders that will be completed uh, before the uh, before the Christmas period. To support a responsive management of COVID-19, the PHA have established a dedicated professionally-led seven-day education support cell that provides support and advice directly to um, principals of schools for any positive cases confirmed in the school community. Um, and that, I hope, just shows the priority that the health sector has placed on the, the joint working and the management of COVID-19 um, uh, with education colleagues. <laughs> Um, uh, and just to finish by mentioning, our staff have been instrumental in supporting children's safe and quick return to school. So, for instance, um, medical specialists and paediatricians in the acute community settings have prioritised their caseloads and assessed children who have been shielding or who have had other complex needs to ensure they were medically fit to return to schools. Community children's nursing teams have carried out fit testing on school staff, supporting children with aerosol generating procedures to ensure they can access the correct level of PPE. I know that Education Authority staff have been working closely with um, their estates departments and schools to ensure that accommodation and equipment needs for children with aerosol generating procedures were in place. Our allied health professionals have worked closely with school staff to reassess uh, children's needs and, needs and to ensure that therapy and educational programmes address those, uh, those learning needs and development. Social care staff have continued to support families uh, with reassurance and necessary support uh, and obviously school staff, staff have worked tirelessly um, to put in place the appropriate public health measures to, to seek to manage and, and minimise the transmission of COVID-19 through the restart phase. Um, so we're, we're confident in the relationships that have been built and the joint working developed throughout the pandemic 
uh, and that they will enhance collaborative work going forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you to all our, our witnesses for your presentations this morning. Um, suffice to say, that evidence is not entirely consistent with the evidence we've received uh, from organisations, from families uh, of children with complex needs who, who feel like they have um, been abandoned. Um, members will have a wide range of questions, so I'll try and uh, get straight to it. Uh, I'll keep my questions as concise as possible, and if we can keep our answers as concise as possible as well. Um, Eilish, can I ask uh, you to give us a very brief recap of what uh, constitutes a vulnerable child? I think you're on mute, Eilish, sorry. Apologies and no for problem. that. Thank you. It captures children who are known to um, social services, either through the um, child protection system, through the care um, system, um, and also includes children in, in, in need. And we've got considerable numbers of children in need who are referred to um, social services on, on an annual basis, around 34,000 um, in, in, in a typical um, year. Um, covers children who access um, CAMS um, services, um, children who um, are um, in EOTIS um, provision, um, access um, nurture um, units um, within schools. Um, but it also um, captures um, children and young people who um, may not have been known to services um, before the pan pandemic. And that's recognising that the pandemic um, generated challenges um, for, for families that weren't present um, prior um, to the pandemic. So it's, it's intended to cover that group of children and young people and um, also. And then the final group are, are children and young people who are asylum seeking or a refugee. Um, uh, children with no recourse to um, public um, funds. That, that's it briefly, um, Chair. Yeah, that, no, that, that's, that's helpful. Uh, and also children with a statement of special educational needs. Right, absolutely, yes. Okay, and uh, I realise this would be difficult, but uh, do you have a, an a, approximate idea of the number of vulnerable children in, in Northern Ireland? Okay, so I mean, I, I I know the numbers of children who are known to um social services, you know. So uh, there are three and a half thousand children who are looked after. Um, around two thousand four hundred children on the child protection register. Um, around twenty four thousand um children um in need, and I've referred to the number of referrals um to social services in, in any given year. So that that's children known to um statutory social services. Okay. In addition, okay. You know that children are referred um to family support hubs, um, for example. So last year, around 7,500 children um, referred to um, family um, support hubs. But I'm also conscious that we know that there are around 107,000 children actually living in relative po poverty or 91,000 children living in absolute um, poverty. So I, I, I think the number is, is, is significant okay. in terms of the overall um, child population. Okay. Briefly, just in addition to that then, Ricky, how many children um, have a, a statement of special educational need or, or, or are in special schools? The latest figure in terms of statements, um, Chair, would be 19,200, uh, uh, of which um, in special schools, the special school population would mostly consist of children with special educational needs statements. It's around 6,000. The remaining 13,000 with statements would be in mainstream. Okay, so tens of thousands, um, at least, uh, of vulnerable children in Northern Ireland. Why then was the multidisciplinary panel process dealing with 200 children? I think, Chris, if I start uh, on that uh, and others can come in behind me as necessary. Um, so the overriding public message at that time um, was to stay at home and many parents chose to keep their children at home in line with that message. However, some children with very complex needs were identified by the trusts and brought to the attention of both departments and various bodies. Um, so we were guided by 
those those numbers and, and the trusts in terms of uh, of the children, uh, and that's where the two hundred and nine figure uh, comes from. Are you concerned that the stark discrepancy between the amount of vulnerable children known to health and education compared to the numbers that the multidisciplinary panels were actually responding to? So the purpose of the panels, um, Chris, was very specific in relation to children with complex needs and disabilities. However, um, the Education Authority, through its various services, was actually dealing with many thousands more of children and in regular contact um, through those services on a risk assessed basis. So in some cases, families were being contacted on a daily basis, those that were known to child protection and education welfare and so on, where the risk was higher. In others, you know, through the youth service, contact may have been on, on a weekly basis. So actually, when you look uh, at it, the multidisciplinary process was a very focused process for those children with the most complex needs. Okay. Um, Chair, Chair, can I come in behind Ricky there just in response um, to that um, question? Uh, I mean, it suggests um, that we weren't providing supports for um, other very vulnerable um, children and young people. And, and I can tell you um, with absolute certainty that children's social services continued to operate um, throughout um, the pandemic. Um, it, we put new regulations in place to support them and um, to do that. Um, there were no services, no children's social services um, suspended um, during the period um, of the pandemic. We may have given social workers a bit longer to undertake some, some work. We may have allowed them to um, do things in slightly different ways, but they continued to respond to, 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 respond to the ch children in need, they okay. came to their attention the children who need, that were in need of protection and, and to the growing numbers of looked after um, children um, who, who, who they have been looking after okay. um, throughout the pandemic period. Okay. I, I just want to read for the committee of that point. That's helpful. But obviously out of thousands of special school pupils, that multidisciplinary panel dealt with 200. Ricky, you said that the minister wrote to special schools um, to ask them to support the pupils for whom it would be in their best interest to be at school. What support did the Minister give to special schools to make that possible? So Chair, the Minister wrote to all school principals in relation to all children um, deemed vulnerable, uh, asking them to identify those children and make contact with those families. Specifically in relation to special schools, we did engage from an early stage with the special school principals in terms of developing bespoke guidance. So uh, the department issued quite comprehensive vulnerable children um, guidance early on uh, in April. We then worked specifically with special school principals to um, provide supplementary guidance which identified some of the specific issues for special schools and we then continued with that engagement with the special school principals along with the EA. Um, throughout the period uh, of lockdown. I'm sure they were very grateful for the guidance. What practical support was provided to the schools, given the, extreme, the exceptional circumstances in which they find themselves? So uh, I suppose there, there were a number of elements to that, in, including um, funding that had been allocated uh, in year. So uh, many uh, millions were actually um, allocated to special schools through um, the monitoring rounds uh, and also in relation to um, the restart and the COVID response. So um, we know that uh, back in up the uh, earlier monitoring rounds, there was specifically 3.4 million that was provided to special schools. There was a further uh, allocation of 3.2 million that was provided to special schools. There was also further allocations in relation to dealing with COVID-19 pressures of around 3.3 million. And there was also funding provided in relation to uh, PPE of around 2 million. Okay, thank you briefly, because I am pushing my time here. Um, of the 200 uh, children that were referred to the multidisciplinary panel process, um, you said that roughly 20% declined uh, the proposed support. Do you know why? 
Uh, I think it was a combination of issues. There was a survey that was carried out to look at that in more detail. Um, Chair, perhaps um, colleagues might be able to come in behind me and give us some detail on that survey. Geraldine and Morris are actually on the line there, so if either of you could come in on that point or, or show them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure, Chair, first of all, apologies. Um, uh, Geraldine Tate from DHA and myself, Morris Beeson from the Health and Social Care Board, are on the phone, and apologies. We, um, uh, our attempts to log in by video um, uh, defeated us. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, of the question around the reasons given for uh, declining the offer of support in the school, uh, I think for some families uh, they had to weigh up uh, whether or not um, uh, the, the offer worked for them, whether or not they, they, they wanted to take it. Some felt that uh, it wasn't appropriate for, for their children, were concerned about uh, their, their health uh, when they were in school. So there were a number of reasons why offers were turned down. Okay. Um, Sorry, it's, it's Sterling here just coming in as well. Um, just in support of what Elish has said, there has been ongoing support. So those are numbers there, the 209 um, considered, and the number that's placed in relation to that. The health um, staff, um, health and social care staff, as well as their education colleagues, continue to support the families through a range of measures and means. So though even those that have been placed and, um, and successfully placed, our staff were out working and providing um, telephone helplines, check-in with parents, um, doing video um, demonstrations for parents, but also for those particularly children with the most challenge of very complex healthcare medical needs that needed um, chest physiotherapy, that needed medical input, the work based reasons required that we were um, still delivering that, and also providing the reassurance to parents and carers at a very difficult time whenever the advice was stay at home um, and giving them the support and um, advice that with relevant PP that we could work and continue to support the child. And chair as well. I mean, the social workers remain involved with the families, and many of the existing services also continue. And as Eilish has alluded to, our early intervention work continued. And Eilish mentioned the family support hubs. Uh, and um, uh, in the first six months of the year, we had 4,000 children referred there, and 793 of those were children with disability. So we were able to to identify supports for for those children as well. I mean, okay. there was a massive job to move a lot of what we uh, used to provide on a face-to-face -face basis onto online, and all of that that took place, and, and all of that was available for for families. Okay, I, I'm over my time. Last question: um, the seven percent um, who whose uh, offers were not suitable, and the eight percent that weren't placed. What were the reasons for that? So I suppose, Chair, we had done um, some ongoing work led by the Children with Disability Lead and our EA colleagues um, directly with families. Um, because of the announcement by the Minister, um, the Joint Ministers at the 10th of April to um, prioritise and work closely with families to try and save these children with access to supervised learning, um, we moved quickly and, as you would be aware of, we developed an oversight group even, in pre even prior to the, the announcement. Um, our, we kept close with local colleagues and engage with families and, as um, Ricky and Morris alluded to, a number of a range of um, needs and difficulties, some of which were the declined was in the timing that was delivered, and um, also that whether they felt that it really truly met the needs, because we also have to recognise that school was a very challenging um, position that the, the access to staff and health did support and our colleagues in delivering that. Um, and also others that they, they were anxious still about their child um, going out into the local community, going into a, a school environment with other members of staff and other children, and also that the support in some cases that they were receiving, they felt were, was meeting their needs at that time. So that was some of the range of um, um, feedback that we have received from our engagement with families directly. Okay. Many more questions, but I need to stop. Karen Mullen, MLA, Deputy Chairperson. Thank you, Chris. I think we all have a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we'll not get them in, but uh, thank you all for uh, your presentations this morning. I just want to pick up very quickly on the family support hubs. It's an area that I have very keen interest in. Uh, you talk there about the 4,000 um, referrals. Um, I suppose I would like to see a breakdown. I would like further information on the referral, what those referrals were and the support that was provided. And also, I would like to ask, um, 
was extra resources given to the family support hubs to be able to, to cope with the increased demand? Morris or Eilish, could you answer that? Uh, it's, uh, Karen, it's Morris here. I, I can answer that. Um, uh, so take it, I, I have a, a full uh, report card covering the period April to June. I also have one for last year. So I can make those available to you and those will set out um, the, the activity that took place. I would particularly commend you the one that uh, covered the period from April to June because it not only breaks, I think it will give you all you want because it breaks down all of the reasons for the referrals uh, and also covers, it has a piece in it around learning from COVID. So there is a lot of information there in terms of uh, reasons for referral, how, work, how the hubs and their partners work differently in order to meet needs, what the emerging issues were that were coming from, from the hubs uh, and some of the anticipated needs, barriers and challenges going forward. Uh, so I, I can make that available to you. Uh, the second question you asked was in relation to funding. And yes, additional funding was made available by, by the department to the hubs to, for this period. That's brilliant, uh, Morris, um, because the partnership model and the collaboration within family, family hubs, my experience of um, the, the community sector is that uh, they, were, they are a very, very good model of working. So it's good to hear that they were invested in over that period. Um, so, just in relation to what, what we heard this morning from the Children's Law Centre, and he's, he's heard the, the, the discussion earlier, so there's no need to go over it um, in relation to that. But what we're hearing from the Children's Law Centre and from children and f from families in particular is that in terms of the second uh, restrictions, the experience was not any better. Um, the experience is not improving for for a lot of families on the ground. Um, and not only that, um, you know, it was clear this morning that they were saying that in the second wave of restrictions, that uh, there not only was there not improvements, but it got worse. So for us, the question has to be, how can that be? And just to follow on from that, I wanted to ask if anyone could explain um, uh, why uh, saying support for children with autism was not provided when there is a legal obligation to do so. And we know that there's a lot of that support that has still not been provided. So, Chair, maybe if I try to start um, and to answer some, some of that, um, Karen. Um, so, I suppose the key, the key thing is in, t in terms of uh, schools restarting at the beginning of term there, that was something which, of course, um, we very much welcome for all um, vulnerable children. Uh, the executive did determine that there would be a two-week extended half-term break uh, during the period of October. And during that time, um, we did continue to work closely with our health colleagues and our, and our EA colleagues in terms of ensuring that, that services did continue. So from an EA perspective, there were services that were maintained during that uh, half-term break right across um, both the SEN support side and the pupil and wellbeing side. So, so those did um, continue. In terms of your question specifically about children um, with SEN and autism, um, <clears throat> I can say that there was a huge effort on the part of both the EA and Middletown Centre for Autism to reconfigure service delivery uh, and to make sure that families that they had been dealing with through the EA's Autism Advisory and Intervention Service and likewise families <clears throat> that Middletown Centre for Autism were aware of could continue to access support either online or through telephone um, contact. On top of that, Middletown did develop additional arrangements and advice and ran a number of webinars on things like managing meltdowns, managing anxiety, and they had 18,000 hits on those webinars. So there were huge efforts made to try and supplement and maintain um, support services for children uh, with autism. I'm um, happy if others want to come in on the back of that in any way. John? Okay, um, my plan, Chair, um, just to confirm that the Education Authority's um, Special Educational Needs Pupil Services are operational for, for schools and young people. Um, we have been operational within Restart, but it is essential that we take a blended and flexible approach. Where these services are on a, an advisory capacity, we are under the, the guidance of the pandemic, we are taking a remote first approach and engaging with, with families and schools. 
and but we are also present in schools and and connecting with schools on site but where it's a direct pupil intervention it is a pupil facing um intervention approach first um but with that will come the appropriate risk assessments in accordance with the setting and the young person that and the school so we are interacting with our young people directly through our sen services and also with our schools and and the services are fully operational Karen, sorry, it's Sterling here again. I um, just want to come in. So unfortunately, we didn't, more than self, haven't heard the, the presentations from Children's Law Centre. We're particularly keen to hear that because we will always learn from others and our stakeholders. Um, there has been significant learning. We absolutely, we have all learned um, in relation to the first lockdown and trying to adapt our practice to the needs. So in particular, we're very fortunate. We know more about COVID. We know more about how to live and how to manage it. Um, we also know that... Um, the public health guidance and where we have supported in that lockdown and that support, both in summer support, but also the education restart, working very closely with our department of education colleagues and putting in place public health um, measures and mechanisms to enable schools to open safely and manage the large number of people. Um, we certainly listened to our health and education workforce have looked at what worked best during that lockdown period when our sales were under challenging um, situations. And we have taken on board and fine tuned those provisions um, and led from that pandemic, it has led certainly to very innovative ways of working, and I have to say, very innovative ways from use of technology, but that is interactive, and also very innovative ways that is integrated integrated across the health and education sector. And we really want to um, enhance and continue that going forward post COVID. We do recognise that remote te technology um, is not um, suitable for all families. We've learned from that. We now have a number of resources up in a range of mediums to support families, which enables us now to be able to really refocus our attention to re the needs of the children and families and get the intervention that they crucially need. In relation to um, our statutory um, responsibilities in relation particularly to ASD, I have to say that our um, ASD um, assessment and support services in each of the trusts work very diligently. Um, as we recognise with assessment of children for possible autism spectrum um, disorders, it is very difficult when you are faced with utilising PPE. So they've used the innovative ways to do that. We've the completed um, all of the child development histories with the parents using Zoom to try and do assessments, linking closely with education colleagues. And also they have set, set up helplines and support that has been very responsive and families have really um, acknowledged that that has really helped in assisting and meeting their needs. And they were there. That was integrated then across the education sector also and facilitated educational restart. We recognise the children with autism face significant challenges going forward in their ability to deal with um, unexpected um, situations. Um, they need to be supported and planned to enable them to do that. So we have a number of very um, um, successful webinars that we have developed and delivered across all of the trust areas with our EA colleagues. Um, in supporting the families in what measures to put in place to enable the children to safely return to school and also social stories and booklets. So we're sorry to hear that that is the experience. We need to listen to that. We need to learn and reflect and try and adapt our practice so that we um, can work as a collective and really support as many families and children as possible now going forward and post COVID. Jillian, thank, thank you so much for that. Um, it was really, really good to hear uh, from yourselves in terms of the detail, the amount of work, uh, the, the, the amount of listening that you are doing and proactively, um, uh, you know, trying to make things better. What I would ask is that it's it's vitally important and I, and I hope that, that, that you do, you know, you do some of it, but it's vitally important that you work very, very closely with organisations like the Children's Law Centre, who are who are working with parents on a daily basis, um, and also, I suppose, the National Autistic Society and others. And, and parents, they have solutions there. They want to help. They want to make it better. They want to be part of your work and shaping it, um, because there's a lot of work going on, but there are still some people who are cut off and left behind. Um, and it's about, um, as you say, at the start, we were in the middle of an emergency pandemic, but it's going to be with us for a while. So it's how we, we can uh, adapt to that. And, and there's some great work, um, much great work that being done by yourselves. I just want to finish off in relation to the respite provision, and it was raised in the earlier session as well. It's on that I have been continuously raising. 
Um, I'm just wondering if any of you could answer. I suppose over the period, um, the first lockdown period, uh, we've seen respite facilities was repurposed, some closed down and repurposed. Some of them had started to open up. In my own area here in the Western Trust, uh, our short break respite provision was closed down before the restrictions came in. Um, and I am not getting any information in relation to when they are likely to reopen. Um, so just really how, uh, when any information or any work that you're doing in relation to getting the respite provision back to pre-COVID, um, because we have to be able to provide that service, just cutting it off is, is uh, having a really detrimental impact on families and uh, children and young people. Now, Karen, it's uh, Morris Leeson from the Health and Social Care Board. Um, yes, uh, uh, Like yourself, can we absolutely definitely recognise the, the importance of, of short breaks of all kinds, from, from uh, day breaks facilitated by uh, voluntary organisations through to uh, uh, overnights based in, in residential facilities for more complex children, and also with our, our fostering, because we also have fostering short breaks. So we are absolutely committed to having those all available at pre-COVID uh, um, uh, levels as soon as possible. Obviously, at the moment, we still work within the, the public health guidelines, uh, and, and we are, uh, in order to keep children safe, and uh, I mean, I don't need to remind you, these are more sticking residential short breaks than those complex children, uh, and it's very, very important that, that we are able to offer a support service in as safe a way as possible. Uh, I meet on, on a, a fortnightly basis with all the heads of service from, from disability services and I can absolutely assure you that they are focused on getting as much of the service available as possible uh, and, and they are very diligent uh, and, and, and passionate advocates for the families that, that they work with. The Children's Social Services did continue to work throughout the, 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 the pandemic uh, and they were in contact with the families uh, constantly. We have looked at, and one of the things we've learned is that in, in positions where the level of short break couldn't be maintained at the level it was before the pandemic, a high alternative method that we might be able to use to support families. So we looked, for example, that could we use the direct payments route in order to, to, uh, to help some families? Uh, could we use support from our volunteer and community partners? Uh, in many cases, what we were able to do was put together support arrangements that encompass both statutory workers uh, and, and also statutory partners. Uh, during the, the, the pandemic and continued, the department has freed the uh, voluntary providers up from the normal uh, um, targets that are set within their contracts in order to allow them to focus as flexibly as possible within current guidelines in order to support families. Uh, it's not the same as it was before, and we, we acknowledge that, but what I would say to you is that, to say that we, have, we are focused on, on, on the rebuild uh, and uh, we are uh, absolutely trying to find as many ways as possible in the meantime that we can support families. Brilliant, Morris. Thank, thank you. Chair, that's me. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Karen. Um, members, I've received notice that Daniel McCrossan um, has to attend a, a funeral uh, shortly and uh, with members Grace and call Daniel next and also ask him to um, respect that grace by keeping his question as concise as possible. Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Chair. I deeply appreciate it. I will be as concise as possible. I have to go away for half. So. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. But I sit here and I'm, I'm scratching my head and wonder um, as to why there is such a conflicting, um, such conflicting uh, uh, statements being made. Uh, it's almost as though the Department for Education are in a parallel universe to that of parents uh, and the Law Centre and the Children's Commissioner and the Mental Health Champion and everyone else who has raised concerns about SEM and families and how they've been affected throughout this pandemic. I, I appreciate that there is good work going on, but I do not think it is anywhere near enough and it certainly isn't scratching the surface. The reality is that during this pandemic, children are suffering, they're being affected, parents feel abandoned, they, when they reach out for help, they cannot get help. Uh, and contrary to everything that has been said, uh, many uh, that are listening in today will be saying that what you're describing is not reflective of reality and it gives me great concern as a member of this committee and as an uncle of a child with severe uh, a complex need, an autistic child, non-verbal, five years of age, I know uh, the battles that I've had to go 
through to get him uh, support and get his mother support uh, as well. I think uh, in terms of, of where we're at, there's ser a serious issue uh, that, uh, that doesn't seem to be getting addressed here. And, and, and I don't know if it's at the leadership of the Department of Education or quite simply if children, but there's certainly something wrong. And given the size of this region, it is 11 council areas, it's 18 constituencies and six counties. We should be 10 times ahead of anywhere else and we should be doing things much better. That is not happening and serious questions do need to be asked about why so many children are being let down. And I'm sorry to tell you bluntly before I ask these questions, uh, what you have told us today does not reflect reality on the ground. And it gives me some concern that either the Department for Education are not getting the message or they just don't know how to deal with this issue. But either way, something needs to be done um, because uh, uh, the parents that are battering down my door uh, are not reflecting what you're telling us today. Just in relation to a couple of points, why has the educational policy debate, including the support plan, been developed without one, quality screening, two, without a voice of the child, and three, without data collection and respect of the impact of the revised policies on vulnerable children and their families? Uh, Daniel, thanks for that. I can um, start and uh, perhaps invite Eilish to talk a wee bit more about the arrangements for the plan itself. Um, I, I can assure you, Daniel, that what I've seen um, during the last few weeks is an unprecedented, unprecedented level of health and education cooperation, which is in proportion to the scale um, of the challenge. Um, we can, of course, always do better and we will want to do better, and we will want to look at the responses from this consultation and work with all our partners, including Health uh, and the EA, uh, and respond appropriately to try and put um, appropriate uh, support in place where there are gaps. Um, Eilish, do you want to speak a wee bit about the plan itself? Okay, if I can come in on, on those particular um, questions. Um, I, I suppose in, in response to the question about um, the e EQIA, I mean, the plan itself is a collection of policies um, brought forward by um, individual um, departments. So um, the expectation um, was and is that those individual policies um, will be subject to um, uh, quality screening and rural needs um, assessment. So um, that's the answer um, to that question. And I am going to put my hand up and say that um, did we do, as we normally do within the Department of Health, and I'm speaking for myself within my own area of, of policy, um, when we develop policies, we tend to um, involve children and young people um, quite significantly in the development of those policies. That wasn't done. Um, in, uh, in connection um, with the Vulnerable Children um, Plan in quite the same way. That's not to say that we didn't have access to the views of children and young people, for example, um, through um, NSPCC's um, helpline, um, Childline. Um, you know, we, we work with NSPCC, we work with Bernardo's, and we work with children uh, in Northern Ireland um, to um, get some indication of the um, challenges um, that children and young people um, were um, experiencing. Uh, the, the plan itself was, I, I've said it at the start, it was developed in response to what the data um, was telling us. Um, and I accept that um, in order to ensure that the plan is delivering, um, likewise, um, we need to ensure that we've got um, data um, to support or otherwise that that is actually um, the case. I, I hope that answers your questions, um, Daniel. I, I don't know whether that's um, satisfactory. No, I I, I, I appreciate that, and I do appreciate that it is a very challenging situation, but even in response to what Ricky has said, Ricky, you're right, the COVID pandemic is unprecedented, but what is not unprecedented is the failure of the department to look after SEN children. This is a trend that is continuing, and if I was to look at other jurisdictions, I would struggle to see the scale of failure that I am seeing here in Northern Ireland in terms of how these families and young people are being let down, and it's certainly not something that I would be defending in any way. Uh, just a, a final question, Chair, because I'm quite time I have in general to attend, uh, and uh, Ilis, I do appreciate your honesty as well. Can you advise us what lessons uh, have been learned from lockdown and how this has translated into the action plan consultation? Specifically, what did you learn from lockdown in terms of providing support to vulnerable children? Uh, what will you do differently if there is further disruption to education owing to COVID-19, which is highly likely given the situation we're in coming into Christmas and January? 
Uh, where are these new and different measures in the action plan consultation? Uh, thank you, Nimble. Thanks, Daniel. Okay, so um, if we can start with the question um, about lessons um, learned, and, and uh, the first response to that. Um, is that I think we need to look at some of the, cons the responses to consultation because I'm expecting that there will be lessons um, to be learned um, from those responses um, alone. And, and we did ask questions about every part of the plan, including was the definition um, right? Um, have we got the risks and challenges um, identified um, correctly? Have we um, identified um, actions um, that will, accurate, will adequately respond um, to those risks, risks and challenges? So th there will be learning from consultation and um, itself uh, of that, uh, I'm in no doubt. But in, in terms of general learning, um, uh, for, for, for me, even in the um, Department of Health, there's a couple of um, points that spring um, to mind. I mean, I do, I do think, and this was referred to by, by the Children's Law Centre, um, we do need to be able to mobilise um, quickly and with the with, with agility um, that um, CLC um, actually um, referred to. We do need to be able to communicate um, and we should be doing that frequently and, and clearly and that's with each other but also um, with people who are in, in receipt of um, services. We do need to collect and analyse um, data. Um, uh, we do need to enable innovative practice and, and I think we did some of that um, during the pandemic um, by way of some of the funding um, measures that we put um, in place. We um, need to make best use of technology. And again, I think there were very fine examples of where that was actually um, done. I think we need to protect and preserve some of the innovative um, practice that has actually emerged um, during this period. So there, has, there have been some really good things done and really good things um, achieved. And I think we need to find ways of keeping um, that going um, into the um, future. I think we need to maintain the um, effective working relationships that we established um, through um, this period because that did um, happen and I want to assure um, the committee of that. But finally, for me, I mean, I do think we need to pay some level of homage um, to the, to the um, frontline workers who actually um, w worked with children and families um, throughout this uh, period, and in some cases, um, placing themselves and their own families um, at, at, at risk. Um, so that, that, that's my thought from the Department of Health um, perspective. Um, in Thanks. terms of the learning. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Okay, uh, just I want Ricky Irwin just to come in on, on, a, on a point in terms of lessons learned, Chair, because I think it is okay. very important okay. if anywhere the lessons learned the Department of Education. Ricky? Um, yes, Daniel. So uh, some, some are similar to Alice's thinking as well. Uh, and as we, as we go through the consultation analysis, we, we will work uh, with uh, health to um, structure these better, but some of my thoughts would be that clearly we have to be better on our communication and our communication around the processes that we put in place for vulnerable children, um, because uh, there was a huge amount of work that was going on, but perhaps that wasn't conveyed uh, in the appropriate way. We need to uh, maintain our stakeholder engagement, uh, uh, indeed, with the likes of the Children's Law Centre and the uh, Children's Commissioner, and look at how we can and perhaps enhance that in some way at times uh, of emergency. Um, we should think about our access points to education for vulnerable children. Um, we did have two processes which were running, one in relation to children with complex needs and a separate process in relation to other vulnerable children. So we want to be clear what the learning is from that and how we can improve that. Like Eilish, we want to look at how technology and supporting um, children in their learning, um, how it can be used to best effect. Um, and I think as well, the final point I would make is we want to look at how we maintain the enhanced level of cooperation that there's been at uh, both an operational level between health and education authorities, but also um, at a strategic level, and then learn from that in terms of um, forward planning. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ricky. Just a very final point for the question. Daniel, sorry, tomorrow, please. Board, if, if, if I could make a point of that, okay? Just, just a second. Yeah, just, just, I, just a second, sorry. I'm, I'm, Daniel, your, your connection's poor here, and I, I do need to bring you to a close. Try, try one last time, final point there. Yes, you can hear me all right now, Chair? Yeah, very, very brief, Daniel, thanks. Okay, uh, just in relation to what you've said, Ricky, I, I think it's very important that there's an overarching plan to deal with vulnerable children to help and support 
uh, those children and their families. Uh, I think, yes, there is a lot of good work going on, but it isn't coming to the surface. It certainly isn't benefiting those who need it most. And that uh, should be uh, the main objective of any support mechanism. So I would like to st any strategy in the overarching plan to help and support those vulnerable uh, children and their families. And at the minute, that doesn't happen. Okay, thank you. I need to bring Robin Newton, MLA, in at that point. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Chair. And uh, can I welcome each of the members that have joined us today? And thank you for, for joining with us. I, I think I'm sure all of you will be aware that uh, right since the committee was again formed, uh, we have been expressing concerns about children at risk uh, and uh, particularly children in special educational needs schools. But let me also join with Eilish and say I do pay tribute to all of those staff who have been working in the front line uh, and, and I agree with her, some of them, who have been putting themselves at risk and their families at risk uh, as they've carried out uh, their duties. Of two short questions, uh, Chair. Uh, first of all, and I'll, I'll maybe come to the questions and then whoever wishes to respond. I'd just like confirmation that uh, all the children, uh, special educational needs children, are now placed in the appropriate school to meet their needs. And uh, the Deputy Chair raised uh, a point I was going to raise about respite, but maybe take it back a wee bit because Children's Law Centre referred to uh, a proposal of 10 years ago that was to build additional respite accommodation, which obviously never came, came to fruition, and perhaps someone would like to comment on, on that, uh, whether that is completely shelved or, or what the situation is. And can I maybe just read out a short statement from the report we were presented with by the Children's Law Centre? It's paragraph 37 of the report that they provided us. Children and families are currently suffering personal injuries, mental breakdown, threat to life and health, and destruction of their right to respect for private and family life. Children are being chemically restrained in the absence of provision of services that they have previously been assessed as needing these are grave and serious human rights abuses flowing directly from the decision of state actors in relation to resource allocation. So maybe whoever would like to address the three questions. Uh, Ron, if I could uh, first take the point of unplaced children with um, statements, um, I will invite EA um, colleagues to address that. Um, they, they, there was a, a lot of work that went in over the summer months and, and in the first months of term to make sure that the young people who had been identified without placements for, for school uh, were placed and there were a number of specialist classes set up to, to um, support those young people. Um, to my knowledge, and we can confirm a, a number, but it is less than five young people um, who do not currently have a, a uh, placement at school, but we will confirm the, the exact amount. We will come back with that. Okay, that has Brittany, been. Sorry, Sterling, will I just come in just in relation to some of the complex needs of the children? Uh, Malcolm, thank you for your question. So, firstly, we, as we said earlier, have been working very closely with our Education Authority, DE, and also with our school colleagues. As you'll be aware, because of the implications of COVID in relation to children with very complex respiratory needs. We needed to identify and work closely. So that work commenced back at the oversight group way back early, um, early June to start to plan and organise what services that they would need. So Mark has mentioned that um, the health and social care staff have really been instrumental in enabling that. We did identify 99 children that fell within that particular need, and that was across both the mainstream and special school sector. We worked closely to review to ensure that these children were and medically fit to return to school and they were not being placed at any greater risk. Our um, community children nursing teams met regularly with the schools, with education, with state services to look at the accommodation needs of those children, the specific nature of um, aerosol generated procedures 
um, to protect the staff and children, a separate room is required and very um, robust IPC requirements as part of that. So they met regularly um, in relation to supporting us. They provided videos for staff on done in and off in an education setting and was mentioned fit testing for education staff and supporting these children um, in these settings. Um, <clears throat> this is critical as part of that development and we are making significant progress. So at this stage regionally we have 99 or 92% of those children returned to school, which is quite um, significant. Children whose parents want them to return, who are medically fit to return, but do have complex respiratory and aerosol generated procedures and we do expect the remaining eight percent to be placed um, in the next couple of weeks. So that is really encouraging. But I want to also say that Yes, um, it's important. You've made very valid points. School is a very safe place. We have a lot of health provision directed in school environments. We have therapy, sessional support. Uh, we have RISE uh, interventions. We have nursing support. And that is critical. And we've worked really closely with our um, education staff and the principals and school staff um, in line with the bubble arrangement, which is working particularly well. And we're very pleased with that um, to enable them to target those children so that those very complex um, needs and disabilities and challenges that the parents are experiencing in the home environment, that we can work and treat those school environment, but very critically keep close to the families and put measures in place to manage in any future um, lockdown or, or ongoing restrictions. So just want to show you that we've we integrated approach across all of our um, professionals, right um, from the tertiary services in the Royal Victoria Hospital for Sick Children, right down to local level and um, working closely with schools. Thank, thank you for that. Okay. No, no, no sorry, Chair. <laughs> Maybe someone would address the the uh, ten year strategy, or the the, the uh, provision that was due to be made ten years ago, uh, and where it's sitting at the moment to provide additional respite. It was recognised ten years ago, apparently. Can I come in on, on, on that point? I mean, I, I think the first thing that I, I, I want to say is that respite can take um, many forms, and I think Morris and both and Mark have both reflected that in the opening um, statement um, today. Um, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to mean um, a child being placed in, in, in a residential um, facility um, at all. Um, it can take the um, form of, for example. Um, specialist um, foster um, care, and, and, and there has been investment in things like specialist foster care, etc., over the course of the last um, number of years, and, and, and plans um, to to increase um, that um, provision. Um, Morris, is there anything else that you want to say in terms of other supports that we have um, been um, providing? I'm thinking about Southeastern Trust, for example, who have um, a specialist child minding. Um, a mentoring service um, uh, within um, uh, within that um, area. Um, anything else that you want to add in terms of additional provision? Not sure if Morris is still there. Oh, sorry, uh, not, I thought. Um, uh, sorry, Alex, what you said, um, Mark, and I was uh, uh, my apologies for that. Um, yeah, yes, there are, uh, as Eilish has said, there are a range, there's a range of provision in terms of short breaks of which uh, residential uh, short breaks would, would, would be at one end and at the other. We look at day, day uh, breaks for children using some of our voluntary partners. Uh, we've been looking at the whole issue around um, uh, a, a foster care day, uh, Short breaks using foster cars both during the day and, and, for, um, and for, for overnight. Um, we are constantly looking at the, the provision that we have and looking for ways to, to enhance that. Uh, and you know, we're, we're currently looking at, as I say, how, how we can do better in order to, to deliver supports to the families. And uh, I have no doubt going forward that that will include looking at, at a range of things. Um, but issues such as, I mean, I've the particular issue around the, the 10 year unit, uh, I'm not sure of the circumstances around that. I mean, in terms of re residential short breaks in particular, I mean, it's a highly regulated activity uh, and it's not an activity that can be very quickly. Uh, and by the way, I'm not seeking to defend 10 years, I'm just pointing out that it can be an activity that's 
not easy to bring to fruition quickly. You have to identify premises that have to be specially adapted because of the complexity of the needs of the children that have to be regulated. So there can be a number of issues why um, uh, something, uh, you know, why it can take a long time in particular. Uh, and as Alice has alluded to, other things like we have used childminders uh, and well, as a particular example in terms of supporting families with a child with a disability. Okay. Um, would someone like to respond to the uh, third point, uh, paragraph 37, children are being chemically restrained in the absence of provision of services that they have previously been assessed as needing? I mean, other than to say, um, I, I, I don't recognise um, the statement, if I'm honest um, with you, um, Geraldine, I don't know whether um, you can um, come in on the point about chemical um, restraint um, at all. Okay, um, Malcolm, I suppose it's important, and, and we do um, look towards our um, um, consultant medical colleagues in the, uh, and the psychiatry colleagues in making the appropriate assessment that best meets um, children's needs is based on nice guidance. But as I did say, the, the restart and that um, support across the families and children has been critical to, to try and support children. Some children do need, do need medication to meet their needs, um, not in the, the chemically restricting phrase, but we do need to engage, and that's very critical of our staff working in our specialist mainstream, our um, medical colleagues um, working closely with families to look at what the impact of COVID has been to them. We know that we expect um, emotional health and well-being as um, challenges for all of us, and in particular our families and children. We need to um, look at that and, and look at best ways of support. I do know Ricky had highlighted earlier the importance of single point of entry, and that's something that we have been, uh, from a health perspective, really keen to progress to meet the challenges of children, particularly children with um, comorbidities, including children known to CAMS, ASD and ADHD, and we do have a framework out at the minute that will provide early intervention, and we are progressing with that and working closely with the trust. And that's about better integration of services with the early intervention to meet the needs as soon as they um, start to um, um, develop putting strategies in place, working closely with families, and then looking at comorbidities, and not only that in the diagnostic, but the supports that those families need, some of which may be um, from a prescribing basis, but it's much wider than that. It's all the supports that Morris have talked about, all of the therapy, their therapeutic interventions that the families do need. We did say earlier we're really keen to hear the voice of the parent and of the child and our wider stakeholders, and that certainly we've, um, we have done some work on that. We need to do more, and we plan to um, progress that, and that's going to be a very key feature. We, um, from a health perspective, have responsibility for uh, person public involvement. We take that very, um, very seriously. And also co-production, we are all aimed at looking and moving towards a co-produced approach. This is a fantastic opportunity from a health and education perspective when we have um, the Cooperation Act, and we're looking at joint plans that will be monitored closely by our, our inspectoral, and we pick those very, very um, want to look at those very carefully and ensure that we get target those families most need that they do not need then to progress on to needing um, more formal education or for, sorry, formal um, medication. Okay, thank you, Chair. Not sure. Thanks, Robin. Uh, can I bring in Robbie Butler? Robbie? Not there. That's me unmuted, that's me unmuted now, Chair. Sorry, I couldn't find the button. Um, just want to thank. Yeah, th thanks everybody for your, for your contribution so far, and we really do not have a lot of time. So I will be uh, as brief as I can. So um, I just want to join with Robin and Eilish actually, um, and recognise that a lot of our frontline staff have actually worked incredibly hard. And whilst there are um, there have been a number of failures and, and, and areas of concern, um, there's also been evidence of, of, of good work. Um, and I just want to uh, thank people, those people out there, the professionals who have worked in. in really incredibly challenging times. And it's good to hear the discussion so far about lessons learned. And uh, hopefully there will be plans in place to do things uh, better and to, to, to just, I suppose, fill in the gaps and, and learn from the, the things that went wrong. But I just want to concentrate, uh, if you don't mind, on looked after children. So obviously uh, there's a piece in the program for government uh, previously. Um, 
uh, and specifically talks about looked after children and the impact of COVID um, on looked after children with regard to their educational outcomes, um, GCSEs and then into um, A levels and, and 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 so on. So I had the, the privilege of helping a young guy out um, at uh, the just in the, at the exam time then, I suppose, because there was the whole conflation of of how marks were awarded and so on. And, and the university, um, to be fair, did square up. It was also university. I helped out greatly. So with regard to what we're still going through, and lost classroom time in particular, and the impact on looked after children, um, has that been something that has been looked at? And what would be the views of each of the bodies here today with regard to any further lost classroom time on the educational uh, impact on looked after children? Um, Robbie, it's Rick Ehrman here. If I um, could try to answer some of that um, for you. So, uh, looked after children are a specific cohort um, within the vulnerable children um, category, uh, and both departments have been working very closely on the development um, of a looked after children uh, strategy. Um, Ahead of that, there has been some significant work in terms of improving educational outcomes for looked after children, and we have evidence um, from some pilots um, which suggests that uh, you know, trauma-informed approach is one of the things that will actually um, enhance um, educational outcomes for those children. So we're looking at how that can be um, rolled out more widely as part of the implementation of the strategy. I think it's important as well to say that the aim of the ENGAGE programme, which the Minister um, had announced, was uh, intended really to catch up on that element of lost learning, and that would be for all those children that need it most. And if that includes certain looked after children, then they would be um, included in that. So funding. Uh, of 11.2 million um, has been allocated to secure additional teaching resources to deliver that engaged program, and I would fully expect that looked after children will will some of them will benefit from that directly if if, if they need it. Um, Alice, is there anything you want to add to that? But very briefly um, before you do, Ricky, but that funding does not is not available to special schools. Um, Chair, thank, thank you for, for raising that. I can um, say that we are now working with um, the special schools uh, in a co-design uh, approach for a bespoke engaged type program specifically designed for special school children who could also benefit from lost learning um, as a result of the lockdown. So that engagement is underway now. Uh, Robbie, you want to come back in there? Oh, so I think it was Ali should be asked there just to, to for her view on that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, just to add to what Ricky has um, said, you know, in addition to focusing um, some of the attention on the challenges posed by um, the pandemic, we did um, continue to develop a look after um, children um, strategy, and um, that hopefully um, will be published in the not too distant um, future. You're quite right, Robbie. Um, the educational achievements for looked after. Um, children are incredibly poor in comparison um, to their peers, which is why the um, strategy um, focuses on learning and achieving and outcomes um, for them. It's also why we developed the strategy jointly with the um, Department of Education. Um, I mean, there, 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 there was investment um, made uh, in the after children services over the course of the pandemic by the um, Department of Health, and, and that included um, providing support for foster care, etc., to assist um, ch children and young people in, in, in their care um, while they were out of um, school, etc. And, and we put some money into our children's homes and, and that too, in recognition of the challenges um, that um, children in residential care have been experiencing um, too. But I just want to assure that the committee and um, both departments are committed to working um, together to close that educational um, attainment gap that, quite frankly, um, absolutely um, needs to be closed. Brilliant. Uh, Alice, thank you so much for that. I have to declare an interest as a, as a part-time foster parent. I just put it on record, I didn't receive any payments from anybody at any stage because we didn't actually foster over this break. Um, but um, and a, lot of the, a lot of the good work that has done and, and has, I suppose, pre-COVID and possibly through COVID has relied on partnerships with community, community and voluntary sector organisations. And I know, Alice, that you talked about, certainly in terms of the... Um, 
uh, looked after children there that some of the some of the provision was made. But there are other charities out there who perhaps are struggling at the moment. Um, is there a fear that some of them may not exist post COVID? Um, because obviously some of the some of the um, previous relationships and, and so on will underpin the, the plan for our, our moving out of COVID. Would there be any issues with that at the moment? So if I, if I can come in and say something um, about um, the Department of Health's core grant um, scheme, um, we do fund, I think it's 67 um, voluntary and community sector organisations um, through that core grant scheme. And, and during the pandemic, we did a couple of things and we tried to get the money out the door more um, quickly um, than, than we would normally um, do in, in any other um, year. But the second thing was that we um, gave organisations the scope um, to adjust what it was they what, what it is they do um, on, on an, uh, in a normal year, um, so that they could actually focus some of their attention on on COVID and support um, families etc. Um, impacted um, by um, COVID. Um, I don't know whether anybody wants to um, add um, to that, Morris, um, from the board's perspective. Ben? Yes, Robbie, it's uh, Morris Gaysen from the Health and Social Care Board. Can I firstly say that thank you for your acknowledgement of, of the contributions of the frontline staff because they'll be very pleased to hear they, they work very, very hard and it's, um, as I say, we're very encouraged by, by your support. Um, but in terms of the, the volunteer community sector, I think one of the really learning points for us that's come out of this has been the fact that where we've worked well in partnership, we've been able to deliver the most effective supports to families. Uh, I would be happy to share with, with the committee, because I know time is precious, but we have done some work through our Children and Young People Strategic Partnership, you know, to look at the, the partnership work that was done during the pandemic. Uh, we have produced a report into the impact on children and families, uh, and also a specialist report looking at the impact on emotional health and well-being. We've also produced a report which looked at a number of activities that were undertaken uh, to, um, uh, during the, the pandemic, which have really, really helped in terms of, of, of supporting families. And the key thing in all of this has been those things wouldn't have been possible without the support of the volunteering community sector. We had a learning event on the 25th of August where we brought together all our partners from, from uh, Bombay sector, community sector, and statutory to look at how well they work together. And if I can just give you just one example that came out of, of the learning which involved the, the, uh, the uh, design to help uh, voluntary community organizations was with the issue of COVID, obviously social distancing is a really, really important issue. So we've created a venue locator which will allow organizations in any sector who are wanting to do work with children or families, but who are constrained by the fact that they do not have uh, appropriate premises. So we've looked to, to match um, organisations looking to support families with premises that, that can help them. As Eilish has said, with the funding, we have been very, very flexible over the, uh, the period of the pandemic, uh, as I say, to, to engage with organisations and say, we know you, you normally do X, but what can you do something slightly different to support families now? And we've had a really, really good response to that. Um, we can learn. Uh, we have, um, across our structures, we engage with the volunteer community sector in our locality work and our family support hub. We have over 600 organisations network through that, through our outcomes group and through PYPSP itself. So we have a continuous dialogue going on there. I would sincerely hope that, that um, we wouldn't see a massive impact because, as I said, Robbie, during the, the pandemic, the volunteer community sector have been enormous, have worked enormously hard and been very helpful in, in helping us and working in partnership with support families. And Robbie, if I could just come in on, on the back of that quickly in relation to a piece of work I think was being taken forward centrally by the Department for Communities, which would have um, lead responsibility for supporting the voluntary community sector. I think there was a, a trawl around uh, individual departments in terms of identifying those charities and organisations that they were working with, which uh, would potentially be at risk. Um, so, so that's obviously something um, that was done by them. And if we could just nip back, if, if I could beg your indulgence for a second, um, Chair, as well, in relation to Looked After Children, and ask Shauna just to provide a wee bit more in terms of some of the direct support that the EA has provided. Thank you, Rafi. Um, yes, the, we in the Education Authority have the Looked After Children Project team led by the, the Looked After Child um, Champion, 
we had 98 young people who were open to that project going into the pandemic and we continue to work with staff and, and foster parents for those young people to make sure that they had some educational resources that were um, of benefit to them at that time and also the project team created a directory of resources and tools to support with home learning and emotional reg regulation and connection at the time. We also developed um, supporting looked after children during the COVID-19 pandemic through a trauma and attachment lens. Two separate guides, one for schools um, and staff and, and one for parents and carers. Um, and also um, coping with, with exceptional school closure support for those young people. There was um, also a, a helpline and, and ele electronic correspondence available for all, all carers and, and social workers with, with looked after young people into that team. And through that team, we supported 271 looked after young people um, during the, the partial school closure period. And in addition to that, we also have 59 young people who are children looked after registered in our IOTIS programmes. And those young people had, had daily and weekly support for their education and learning as well as their own well-being. Um, in addition, in, in preparation for, for restarting through the lockdown period as well, there was a suite of resources provided to schools to support um, the education particularly to that cohort of young people returning to education and activities um, it, of a therapeutic nature and promoting the care of, of those young people within our educational setting. So, that team um, continues to work with, with schools, faith social workers and foster carers um, to support their wellbeing, but also to address any educational underachievement um, okay, at this time and as we progress. Okay, Robbie. Yep, sir. Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. That was comprehensive, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, thanks, Robbie. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Ricky, Brenda, Michelle, Shauna, Eilish, Mark, Geraldine, and Morris. And thank you very much for your important evidence today. Um, I recognise the enormity of the challenge you've all faced since the onset of this epidemic. I know your worlds have been turned upside down, your roles have been turned upside down, the roles of your teams have been turned upside down, and uh, your frontline staff have worked incredibly hard and they've put themselves in danger and their families in danger in many cases. I'm sure it's been really, really difficult for them, many, you know, many of whom will see their people, the kids that they work with as part of their family, and to have that blocked and stopped in such a manner as it was so abruptly, it must have been very, very tough. Um, and I, I have no doubt that the the, um, the the thoughts of you all was to do the best by the kids, I and mean, you think that you're, you're, you you reported this morning many positive things that have happened as a consequence of the pandemic in terms of how the social care sector have worked so cohesively during this pandemic. You, you'd hope that that would be happening all the time, but that is still positive, and you've had to be innovative. And you, you've uh, recognised the, the will of the, 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 child, the Children's Law Centre, which is the need for services to move quickly and with agility. And from our, all of our experiences, from all of the MLAs who've, who've spoken this morning or today already, um, and from what we've experienced in terms of the information coming to their offices and the cases coming to their offices, is that has not been the case, sadly. And I, I recognise you've all been working very, very hard to try and make things right, but the, 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 feeling, the, the, the reality on the ground is very, very different to the positive story you're, you're giving us here today. And um, one point that I've been raising along with uh, Robin Newton during this pandemic, and it's, it's just something that's really, really worrying for me, and we've seen a surge in terms of uh, the pandemic in many instances. We've seen a surge in terms of domestic violence, which is really, really scary. We, there, what has been the impact on at-risk children or children who have been impacted by domestic violence? What, what is the data in terms of what, what do you know about how many children have been impacted and who are now not safe in their own homes as a consequence of this uh, pandemic and as a consequence of lockdown and as a consequence of not being able to get to school where school was their safe place. How many kids has that impacted? Justin, thanks for your question. That's probably one that um, both departments um, uh, uh, probably need to try um, and address. So uh, from an education perspective, I'll, I'll invite Shauna to talk a bit about um, some of the direct support that the EA provided to those children most at risk. Thank you. 
Um, yes, the Education Authority with immediately established a vulnerable young persons focus team within its structure in response to COVID. The team dedicated our resource to supporting vulnerable young people uh, and their families as well during the lockdown period. And we are very well aware that there are young people experiencing home situations with, with a toxic mix of, of drug and alcohol, um, abuse, domestic violence, um, extreme parental mental health issues, and welfare issues more generally. Um, so the, the team, our priority was to make sure that all of the young people within our services um, there was contact made that those young people felt safe, that they knew that they were heard um, by someone and that they knew as well where they could access help. The team included uh, a mixed skills base across the Education Authority which was made up of our Education Welfare Officers and looked after staff who are all social work trained. It included teachers, youth, youth workers um, and officer staff who, are, who are, have experience with, with wellbeing and welfare in supporting vulnerable groups and families. And we can coordinated our response uh, with with programs and um, and contact. The each each young person opened services from the announcement of partial school closures had contact um, and a contact and welfare plan was put in place. This amounted to around five thousand five hundred young people per week, and those contacts um, were made first on a daily basis and then. In collaboration with other agencies involved with the young people and with the families and um, as well as what the needs of the families and the young people were and these continued on a daily basis throughout the, the lockdown and partial school closure period or they they went to two three times a week or at the very least once a week some of the programs that were in place came from um, our post primary and, and primary older centers where young people were provided with um, they're learning through online lessons with up to, to 30 lessons on literacy, numeracy, um, well-being um, and, and some very creative subjects really through, through those online platforms. They were also assisted with, with food, with access to technology and with general um, well-being and mentoring support. Education welfare officers um, as well were connected with 130 families. And each of those education welfare officers made contact in accordance with the need of that family. There were also 85 school age mothers with a plan in place that included online, online sessions, mentoring, access to food and technology and signposts and to other supports within the community. I think one of the, the um, roles that our, our support officers needed to play was making sure that families were aware what services were there to provide for them, what services could help. Um, if they needed it and how they could access um, welfare, food, free school meal applications, um, food banks, anything that was required during that time and also to support them through some of the difficulties with job losses. Um, okay, Shauna, can, Shauna, just sorry to intervene, we're, we're running really close to time here. If you could draw that summary to a close and, and I'll allow Justin to ask a further question. Thank you. Yes, just to say that, that for those 5,500 young people who were open for welfare or issues across our services were supported on a, on a daily basis. Plans were put in place. Those plans were all, always in collaboration with any other agencies, be that CAMS or social services or youth justice, that were open to that young person um, and that family so that they could be confident in the support that they got. Lots of the, the feedback that we've had from families and young people is that they feel supported. Um, and that they, they welcome the connection with services with parents and families rather than services going through schools and young people to families. So that is one of the positive learnings that we've been able to, to take from that and to build on the relationships that we do have with, with um, our vulnerable parents and vulnerable families and young people. Okay, Sean, listen, it's reassuring to hear that you've, you've been so proactive. Can you tell me that every child is safe in their own homes as a consequence of COVID-19 and the lockdowns and the restrictions and potential school closures. Can you tell me that you're proactively ensuring that every child is safe in their own home? I wouldn't be able to confirm that, but I can confirm that where we are aware that there are young people in need, um, our education services are in place to make sure that there's a wraparound curve for, the, for those young people and that we are connected with their, 
their um, health and social or with our health and social care colleagues around their protection, and that any escalation procedures that are needed, that we are following those, um, and and we are putting additional supports in place for young people, and that young people also know where to connect with support, be that online or through their their key connect professional. And I think Justin, if we maybe could invite Eilish to speak from the health side of that um, support in terms of any child protection um, referrals and so on that that are made and have been made during lockdown, Eilish. So, in, in response to your question, Justin, about the numbers, we absolutely know that there were higher incidents of um, domestic violence and referrals that actually came to the attention of um, social services. Just very quickly, in one trust, um, there was a 68% um, increase in domestic violence um, referrals um, in May 2020 compared to uh, May 19, or, and a 29% increase in July 2020 compared um, to July um, 19. That's just to give you a measure of, of, of the extent of the issue that, that, that you're quite rightly um, concerned about. What we did within health, um, then um, there was further funding um, uh, put into the 24-hour um, helpline. We invested um, some funding um, uh, in women's aid um, so that they could put in place um, a greater number of um, care packages for families experiencing domestic um, abuse. A number of aware awareness raising campaigns were relaunched um, to remind um, victims how to seek help um, with particular emphasis on both virtual and silent um, solutions. And the PSNI, um, I want to acknowledge the work um, that they did um, too. I mean, they did lead uh, a multi-agency proactive um, operational response, and, and that involved um, making contact with um, victims um, who um, were at the highest levels of, of risk um, domestic, uh, to domestic um, abuse. But it also um, meant making contact with those who were known um, to pose a risk um, to victims, and that was all done by, led by um, the PSNI with the support of other agencies um, as, uh, as appropriate and necessary. Um, one thing that the members may be aware of too is um, some of the very innovative um, work that was done within Boots Chemist, where they did actually um, create um, safe spaces um, for victims of, of domestic abuse um, so that um, an individual was able to actually make contact and with support um, services in, 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 a safe, um, in a safe way. Okay, thanks, Alicia. One, one quick question, Chair, if you'll... Um, Thank, thanks, allow. Justin. Okay, yep, be brief, thanks, thanks, yep. Um, sorry, um, respite, you've mentioned we've discussed, discussed respite already at length, um, and in terms of remote access, obviously respite can't be done remotely. I know families here in Yuri Arma are really, really suffering as a consequence of the of CARICOR not being available or Rathor in Arma or Senate Rathor um, Oaklands. Those two centres who which provide a lifeline for families and you know financial support has been offered to families, but that is not any use in, in the circumstances. They need they need a break and they need they need a break to break the the brilliant service that those those facilities provide. I've written to Richard Pengelly already um, about the potential for providing um, further respite facilities. What's your perspective in terms of respite uh, availability for parents and families and children who need that break, and need those short breaks, and rely on them for their own, for their family's mental health and well-being and physical health? Well, I think I think Morris has already um, acknowledged that um, this is an area that we absolutely need um, to do um, better, in, and a number of members have raised it um, today. Um, unfortunately, um, short break services were in many cases actually um, suspended at the start of the pandemic, but there has been a, a concentrated um, effort, again, that Morris has um, described um, to actually get those services um, up and running um, again. But I do want to make the point, um, Justin, that it's not just about um, residential um, services. I think there are other ways that we can actually provide um, families um, with the support that they actually need. And, and we are doing um, that and have continued um, to do that um, through the um, pandemic. Do we need to do better? We absolutely um, do, and, and, and I put my hands up for that. Well, the, the family's experiences that I've spoken to, uh, Elish, has been not, not the same as what you're talking about. They've only been offered financial support, and that, that's no, no assistance for them really in, in, this, in this circumstance. No, I, 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 I admit that we need to do better um, in terms of um, short um, provision. Um, just, but just, 
Justin, Justin, it's Morris Leeson from the Health and Social Care Board, and I really appreciate your question. Um, uh, I, the, the, the staff um, of all the trusts are, are, are aware that uh, um, with the families they work with, that the, the impact that COVID has had on particularly the residential short breaks ha has been massive. And as I just described when I said earlier, the, the staff have done their level best to look at are there other ways that families can be supported in the meantime. I, I am very aware that, that, that in many cases they, what's been put, what's been offered and what's been put in place has not been something that the families have, have felt matches what they had before uh, and, and we acknowledge that. Uh, and I think for, for us really, we, uh, as Ali should describe, the, the staff on the ground keep engaged with the families, keep listening. Uh, we are doing our level best to bring services back as quickly as we can. Obviously safety is our, our, our overriding concern. But, but I, I do acknowledge what you're saying is that um, uh, despite our best efforts, yes, there will be families, and they do tell us that who are feeling that what we are doing is not, you know, um, uh, matching what what that they had before. Okay, Justin. Yeah, okay, I just want to encourage you guys to um, move quickly with agility as uh, proposed by the Children's Law Centre, and I wish you well with the really, really important job you all have, folks. Really, really wish you well. Thanks, Justin. Morris Bradley? You there, Morris? There you are. Here, Chair. Thanks. Thank you very much. Chair, in relation to maybe a question that Daniel had, had asked earlier on, it's uh, to do with uh, the planning, which was designed, I suppose, for an emergency, and to get us over an emergency, and now that we're in an expected second wave of COVID-19, possibly a third wave in January. Like Daniel, I would ask what feelings have been identified from the initial measures and have they been addressed uh, for this current wave and potential future waves of COVID-19? But unlike uh, Daniel, I, I would prefer a written briefing to be supplied to the committee through the chair, identifying the feelings and uh, telling us how they've been addressed. Okay. But uh, through you, Chair, I have a question. And I'd like to ask what measures are in place for children suffering from dyslexia? And thinking of dyslexia, uh, many children have difficulty putting their ideas and solutions down on paper. Uh, in particular, what I would be concerned about would be teachers and schools in general. I know teachers, head teachers and assistant teachers, I mean, they're all doing an exceptional job in exceptional circumstances, and I, and I would like to put my thanks to them on the record. But uh, most children suffering from dyslexia are in mainstream education. Nonetheless, this is a special need. So what I would like to know, are, are teachers sufficiently trained or being offered appropriate and suitable training in identifying children suffering from dyslexia? Uh, and. Is there any education program to take this condition into account? And I'm thinking about oral and practical examinations to take the place of written tests and formal testing. Good question, Morris. Thank right. you. The okay. Um, yes, Morris. Thank, thank you for that question. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to direct uh, you to Shauna from the Education Authority, who's going to speak about the support that's provided directly for children with dyslexia. Thank you. Our services that that support um, staff supporting these young people and support the young people directly. Um, they, they are operational um, for schools and for staff. There is training that is available um, for schools and staff. Um, we have moved to making the majority of that training online and accessible to staff at a time that suits them, um, as well as having bookable sessions um, that are appropriate. We also have a suite of resources that are available for staff and for young people via our website and via the, the C2K platform, which all education staff have direct access to. Um, and the service is then also delivered um, in the advisory capacity, working with the school and the school staff um, in the way that best meets their needs, and then directly to young people. Um, the, the service is maintained um, delivery directly to young people. And again, where there is an issue, be that with them, a, a school bubble or a risk assessment that doesn't allow that direct delivery to happen. Uh, we are looking at, at all all possible methods of delivery, be that online or connecting with the family. So that service is, is maintained um, and is delivered at present, and training is available for staff. Thanks very much for that. But uh, what's the uptake of, of training? Uh, I don't have the numbers. Uh, this morning, but that is something that, that I can liaise with my colleagues in those services and, and report back to committee. Yeah, 
and I'm thinking mainly last last one, uh, Chair, and of course I'll be brief. Thanks, Morris. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, remote learning, and if someone is suffering from dyslexia, should it be letters or, or numeracy? How are they expected to uh, cope with online learning? Suffering from dyslexia. We, one of the, the resources that is available from the Education Authority is a, um, a, a magazine that, that promotes um, the, the skills required uh, for young people and, and this is something that is um, sent directly uh, electronically to young people, families and staff. Um, it is around school staff and service staff learning um, and, and trying to support young people within this new world of, of a blended learning approach um, and, and there will be training developed in accordance with those needs as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Morris. Uh, members, we're on quorum. I need you to stay with me. I have two really, really fa quick final questions uh, to the Department of Education. Um, Ricky, uh, temporary continuity directions specifying a, a minimum standard of remote learning for children uh, learning at home has have been issued by the Department of Education in England. Um, can you advise why a temporary continuity direction has not been brought forward by the Department of Education in Northern Ireland? Chair, thanks for the question. Um, what I can say is that in relation uh, to what schools have been asked to do uh, to support children through remote learning, um, if an individual child or a small number of pupils across a year group have to self-isolate for a, a designated period due to COVID, parents should be talking directly to their school uh, about provision of education materials. The department has asked schools to have contingency plans in place for the delivery of remote learning in the event of a school closure, or indeed that a class or group of pupils need to um, self-isolate, and schools will promote remote learning tailored to the needs and aptitude um, of their pupils. And in order to support schools in taking this work forward, the department has relaxed the range of statutory requirements, for example, in relation to assessment and school development planning to reduce the bureaucratic um, burden and free up time for um, curriculum planning and um, remote learning. So, um, Chair, I suppose that the answer to the question is that the department doesn't feel that a temporary continuity direction would be the correct approach under those circumstances, uh, and we'd rather support schools in delivering remote <coughs> learning for those pupils that require it. It's a fairly bold conclusion. Why, why, is, why has England considered that it is a good policy? I suppose the systems are, are different, Chair, uh, as you know, uh, and um, obviously consideration as to how best to support children's learning needs has has been given here within the department, uh, and, and that's the current position um, that, that we have. And you know, there have been a range of further resources and guidance materials that have been um, provided to schools. This was considered as part of the department's continuity of learning um, project. Um, the use of uh, C2K uh, as an online service desk portal, also the scheme in terms of providing additional IT resources and Wi-Fi access to those who are educationally disadvantaged and vulnerable learners. That has been rolled out and that, that indeed remains open. So there have been a range of measures that have been put in place um, to deal with the scenario uh, of remote learning. Okay. And how is the department monitoring or assessing the adequacy of that support and the consistency of remote learning provided to pupils learning from home? So, uh, Chair, I would probably need to write back to you with a detailed response. My understanding would be that the Education and Training Inspectorate have been involved in the evaluation of uh, remote learning and the measures that have been um, put in place, but I, I would prefer um, okay. uh, to give you a more detailed response, probably in writing. Okay, look, for, that look forward to receiving that. Very briefly then, uh, Shauna, you said that the Education Authority send support services are fully operational. Um, I, my understanding is that would include provision like behaviour support, the autism advisory service for schools, is that right? Yes. Yes, yes, okay. that's correct. The, the feedback that I'm receiving um, to some extent is that 
there may be differences of interpretation in terms of fully operational. Um, in what way is that behaviour support and autism advisory service accessible? Is that available via mobile phone or is it by email? Um, what, 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 what does fully operational mean? In, in terms of access to the service, um, the, any new referrals will come through the usual referral uh, system and then with, with, we're working directly with schools, so officers are directly accessible to schools um, and to families if, if that's the, the correct provision under the service delivery. Um, that, that may be online, it may be by phone or it may be um, through home visits and, and visits in the school. So it's fully operational and the, the method, I suppose, is dependent on the, the presenting circumstance of the educational setting of, of the young person um, and of the, the, the service member of staff delivering. Okay, so because our, our schools are fully operational on a in-person daily basis, and is that is that the case for the EA and support services? Yes, absolutely, where we can be. There are, there are some restrictions, um, for example, with regards to staff members crossing across bubbles um, be, by being part of the class for observations or, or direct um, pupil intervention, but uh, strategies have been put in place to support that by re maybe re reducing the number of young people seen within a day but extending the time slightly. Um, or, or other provisions that are needed to support that particular circumstance, but all, all of the service staff um, who would be delivering in schools are delivering in schools, um, or there are plans in place with the school around um, kind of a flexible or, or blended approach at this, at this time. Okay, that's, a, that's obviously an issue that the committee will want to come back on, but uh, thank you so much for the extensive time that you've all given to us today. And we look Chair, Chair, could I, could, could I, could I make just fa some final, a couple of final points? Just it, it won't take very long, if, if that's okay. Go ahead, Rick. Extremely brief. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt there. Um, just I, I want to make the point. I think this is important that on behalf of DE and EA, I can assure the committee that we are completely committed to removing any barriers to vulnerable children and young people um, accessing education um, and to supporting. The most vulnerable uh, in terms of their learning needs. So that, that would be the first point. The second point um, would be that we are completely committed with our health partners and the organisations that you've heard from today to continue that level of collaboration and cooperation and to learn the lessons from the first period of lockdown and the more recent restrictions on how we can actually uh, improve uh, and uh, make services better. And, and finally, um, and like health colleagues, um, on behalf uh, of, of staff in both DE and, and EA and across um, schools, what, I, what I've witnessed uh, are staff who have stepped up during what has been a very difficult um, period in all their lives. And I'd like to commend all those staff who have worked um, tirelessly over the last few months. Thank you, Chair. Th thanks for that, Ricky. For the avoidance of any doubt on my part as well, I, I cannot thank frontline staff enough. This committee cannot recognise the service of frontline staff enough across the COVID-19 pandemic. The job of this committee, though, is to scrutinise systems and budgets, and we welcome the commitment and the assurances that you're given with regards to... Um, the system's working for vulnerable children, um, but serious, serious concerns and testimonies have been received by this committee, so we will continue to do that job of, um, of asking questions about those systems to make sure that your aim is delivered by those systems. So, and, and we thank you for your engagement with the committee to make sure that we all contribute to that aim at the end of the day. Thanks very much indeed, folks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay, members. Um, can I bring ask the clerk uh, to come in then? Ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all witnesses and add all of the members back into the spotlight and keep them there until the end of the meeting. Can I remind members that the committee um, must respond to the consultation today and ask the clerk to summarise actions uh, in that regard?
Thanks, Chairperson. Just want to make sure we have a quorum. Um, we've definitely got Karen and Karen, Chris, Robin, obviously. Justin, no. I, Daniel is still there as well <laughs> for some reason. All right. Is um, that so yes, we do. Is we do. Morris yeah. still there? Morris is there. No, he's not. One, two, three, four. Is that Morris's room? Or? That's Daniel's room. <laughs> members, we're a bit. Oh, there we go. There's, There's Morris. Morris. That's pretty Morris, you've, saved, you've saved this, Morris. Right. Thanks. Right, members, help. Right, members, help. Please. Okay. Okay. I'll be brief. So, Chairperson, is the committee then content to respond on the consultation, um, seeking details of how the evaluation, which has just been mentioned, has been uh, undertaken of the services that have been provided? And um, given that there seems to be something of a disjoint between what officials said and what stakeholders said to encourage them to gather evidence from the stakeholders in devising their uh, policy going forward. Um, secondly, then to call for a uh, multidisciplinary, cross-departmental, permanent, coherent, vulnerable child process, which will be transparent with a single point of entry, with like a responsible officer for each uh, sort of individual child. Additionally, then, is the committee calling on the department to bring forward a temporary continuity direction in respect of send provision and respite um, so as to cover all future possible educational disruption and to provide the resources that would be needed to go along with it. Um, fourthly, then, um, is the committee asking um, for the department to assist schools to open outside of uh, normal opening hours in order to provide this uh, additional um, SEND support? And then, um, in addition to that, uh, are we asking for some information, including the lessons learned report? Uh, and the Health and Social Care Board seem to refer to some other specialist reports about well-being and, support it and how they've supported families. Um, additionally, then, um, is the committee asking for the department to specify uh, or to quantify the extent of partial timetables um, that are in use in special schools? Because that was not something I'd heard before. Yeah. Um, additionally, uh, to give us an update on the um, aerosol generating children, so children that have aerosol generating procedures, a number was quoted there, and perhaps we could get uh, an update on that. And then uh, ask the department to comment on, and the Education Authority to comment on what the Children's Law Centre talked about, a, what they called a staffing crisis in special schools. Um, was there a need for um, volunteers to be used, and are they being used? Then asking for a breakdown of the 4,000 referrals to the family support hubs, including the resources that were, that were um, um, given to, to, to deal with those referrals and also seeking information on the uptake of training for dyslexia. Sorry, members, did I leave anything out? Did you put it in there, uh, Clark? Um, sorry, the request from the Children's Law Centre in terms of their proposals? Um, OK, so what the, what the Children's Law Centre were asking for was the... Um, multidisciplinary, cross-departmental, coherent, vulnerable, permanent child, uh, child, uh, vulnerable child process, which would be transparent with a single point of entry and a responsible officer. So I kind of just lifted that out from what uh, uh, Rachel had said. If that um, will satisfy. Yeah, there's a there's a number of items in there that have been drawn from Children's Law Centre evidence, Justin. Yeah, including that the temporary so, continuity yeah, direction. We're going to write to the ministers to seek to have them. But so uh, I think the, answer, the idea is we respond to the, there's consultation um, on this so that the answer would be these things. Yeah, that they, they should gather all this evidence. They should set up this permanent process. Um, you know, they should try and somehow address the disjoint, which I think members thought there was in terms of what officials said and what stakeholders said. And uh, so that would be you know, your, your way forward um, in, in terms of the consultation. Here's your juncture to uh, change how this is done going forward. Okay, Justin, there's a way to, around that to, to uh, submit the consultation response and to send the, the consultation response to the, to the relevant ministers that you mentioned as sure. well, to, to cover all those issues with them. Okay, yeah. To the DE, with that, yeah. DE and DOH yeah. ministers, yeah. Okay. Members, any other comments in, in relation to the proposed uh, submission to the consultation? Are content to agree? Agreed. Also, Agreed. then, Chairperson, because um, members had the CLC here earlier, so we'll write to the Children's Law Centre 
Just ask them to quantify the number of children who are subject to chemical restraint. Ask them also to quantify the mainstream school mental health issues and seek their views on the impact of disruption um, on uh, the provision of examinations and what sort of uh, rights or other uh, impacts uh, that might have. Perhaps if we could ask them just to um, detail what constitutes chemical restraint in their, um, in their finding as well. I was a particularly disturbing piece of evidence received today, and that would be helpful to get clarification on that. Agreed. Is Agreed. Great Agreed. members, yep. I've got some nod heads. Go Agreed. ahead, Clark. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Yep. I think we're good then. I think we're, we're on to okay. correspondence. But if members, bear with me. We'll be very rapid in terms of correspondence. Clark, do you want to speak to correspondence? Chairperson, I'm just going to ask members uh, to have a look at the summary note at page 212 and ask if they are content to discharge the correspondence as indicated um, there. Uh, there's a few um, in there. Um, but hopefully the um, suggestions um, uh, that I've come up with will be okay with us. just the following sort of additional ones. At page 272, uh, Belfast City Council Councillors seeking a meeting with members. Um, uh, there's a young people's group that they put together and they had uh, the findings of a report on their views on relationship and sexuality education. So do you want to arrange an informal meeting? Yeah, members okay. content to meet informally, agreed. 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 Thanks. Then also there was an invitation from a school, um, which is the first we've had in a while, asking the chairperson to visit and view the work of its agricultural club. My suggestion to members is for now, maybe we don't do this just yet, um, you know, given the, uh, the public health considerations, and maybe postpone um, consideration of any such visits for a bit. Yeah, it was, so the, the invitation, uh, a school, Holy Trinity College, Clark, um, had, had done some excellent work um, as part of its agricultural club uh, in relation to uh, rearing of a calf, I think it was, Clark. Um, I would have been, as our city dwelling representative with... Uh, relatives in the farming industry i would have been really glad to have uh, made that visit and perhaps we could congratulate the the club on the work that they have undertaken um but as you say explain that visits um are not possible just at this time but that we'd be keen to engage with them when that is possible members content with that response yeah great okay thank you, thank you. okay is that all correspondence, Clark? That's it, yes, okay. Chairperson. Forward work programme, agenda item 8 is at page 304. Um, Clark, do you need to speak to anything in relation to the forward work programme? Just to remind members, we have an informal meeting on the Tuesday at 9.30 of the 24th with the homeless period. Um, and then we also have our informal Zoom event, which is on Thursday, the 3rd of December. And the Minister has confirmed for the 9th of December. So there may be issues okay. members wish to discuss. Could you, Clark, could I maybe ask if you email members just a reminder and a few details in relation to the informal meetings in particular? We will do. Okay, we'll that, that would be great. Members can tap with the Four Work Programme, agreed? Yep. Okay. Lovely. Any other business? Yes, Chair. Sure. Yes, Justin. Um, a teacher contacted me, um, pulling her hair out essentially at the fact that there are exams proceeding on Monday morning, science exam, I believe in GCSE, GCSE module exams. Uh, JSEQ have said to them that they need to have a contingency measures or plan in place for any um, out of the ordinary happenings, which are very possible in terms of COVID, as you all know. Um, teachers and vigilators have no clue about what the COVID arrangements actually are in terms of what, what they actually do in examination halls about around distancing, around handing out exam papers, about collect, collecting exam papers. Uh, they're wondering, is it just business as usual? They have no uh, advice or guidance to the contrary at this point. And now we're talking about exams starting on Monday morning. What, what, what can we advise to these teachers and uh, vigilators who are really worried about no guidance or advice coming from CCA or the department. Apparently there's a paper with 50 or 58 points on it, which uh, is supposed to come forward. It hasn't come forward yet. We're, de we're, like, we're a few days out from an exam starting. What is happening? Uh, that, is, that is truly astonishing. Uh, so the Department of Education and CIA have provided no COVID-related guidance to schools with regards how to conduct examinations that are, that are taking place on Monday. Correct. Clark, 
well, we'll write to the department. Uh, I'll write to them today and ask them to that the committee wants them to urgently um, action this and to give um, guidance to yeah. schools as soon as possible. I mean, in addition to that, Justin, as well, obviously, there we post primary transfer and examinations 2020 21 have been debated um, at length. This committee has done all it can to put those issues on the agenda. And there are now examinations, GCSE examinations taking place on Monday, um, for which pupils will be absent due to a COVID related absent. And, and we have no feedback as to how that is going to be dealt with either. It's, it's an unacceptable state of affairs. Members content that we write to the Minister of Education seeking urgent guidance um, with regards to COVID safe examination practices and indeed what contingencies are in place for pupils unable to attend those exams next week. Agreed? It's completely, sure, it's completely up in the air. What happens on Monday morning if a child uh, calls the school saying I'm COVID positive? The, what happens to the class then? What happens to the teachers? It's completely up in the air. There are, there are pupils in Northern Ireland who will be unable to attend and complete those exams next week due to a COVID related absence of that I'm aware and as far as I'm aware we are still yet unaware what the contingencies are for that situation it's completely unacceptable we'll, we'll, we'll raise that as a, in addition to the routine amount of times we've raised it with the minister and we'll, we'll emphasize the urgency of that given we are now it is now not a debate it is a reality next week Members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Right. Any other business? No. Nope. Okay, then our next meeting is next Wednesday, 25th of November in room 29 at 9 a.m. Clark? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And the meeting will have to conclude at noon. Members, we were dealing with some really serious issues there today. Um, I realize time has gone on longer than it ought to have. Thank you for your patience and your contributions given the seriousness of those issues that we were dealing with. Thank you. The meeting does now adjourn. Thanks. Thanks, members. Well done. Assembly, committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly committee room 29.